English participants, uh, distinguished professors, I would like to welcome you to the third international conference on nutrition, health literacy, and education that is organized in Hajitipa University by Sabri Ulkar Foundation. Today we are going to be together with valuable professors. Before I start my speech, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Duygu Akshay Paksu from Sabri Ulkar Foundation. I'm very pleased to be with you today. First of all, we would like to thank everyone who has made efforts to organize this conference in Ajatepe University this year. In societies where health literacy is at high levels, prevention of diseases, early diagnosis and correct treatment can have better results. So, as well as provision of good health services, correct nutritional habits and high health literacy make a big difference in terms of public health. With this conference, we are going to bring together experts on various topics for a healthy society. We're going to discover new areas. We're going to create new cooperation areas and generate new ideas. Before we move on to the opening remarks, well, now we would like to show you a video, which is the introduction of Sabri Care Foundation. For the future of social health, we should produce today, work today, and raise awareness today. And exp explain the importance of science and being scientific, and to ensure that uh, reliable information reaches society. This is our objective for the last 10 years. This is our raison d'etre. Nutrition, food, and health-related scientific information are being pro provided to the society uh, guided by an independent scientific board. We started working on this 10 years ago with our national and international stakeholders and in cooperation with the reference institutions of the area, we are working on um, sufficient, healthy and balanced nutrition and we are trying to share the scientific uh, information and knowledge about this with the society and we have held tens of workshops for that and we focus on the children balance uh, at um, meals project this is the most comprehensive balanced diet project it made a difference seven million children parents and teachers were reaching our project in the primary schools throughout the world we are reaching many children Every day, project day starts with physical activity and the children are learning about the specifics of healthy nutrition and balanced nutrition. Young scientists are contributing to our science, so they need support. Sabri Cash Science Award is organized for this mission and support is provided to the selected projects. The first digital information platform is established uh, by experts from uh, the world, and we called it Sciences Talking About This. This has been an important channel. The first internationally accredited um, nutrition and health communication program brought together all kinds of scientists and experts in this area, and each year, Communication professionals and uh, medical students are provided this training, which is the first of its kind. Sabri Care Center, which was established in Harvard University, is also providing a lot of inventions and knowledge to the world. Once every two years, we are organizing Metabolism and Life Symposium with the participation of important experts and um, Nobel laureates. And updated health issues are being discussed in Nutrition and Healthy Life Summit. This is an important event that we organize. Popular science, academic publications and children's books and also reference examples from the world are being shared with the people with our foundation. So we are reaching school with our books. The late Sabri Ulker's philosophy is feeding our activities and we are cooperating with respected reference institutions all of these activities first crawled 
at the beginning of the 10 years, now it has developed, and now it is bearing fruits under the umbrella of the foundation. So based on the inspiration of that we get from our achievements and success, we are moving towards a healthy society and healthy individuals because the future is ours. Sabri Uker Foundation is 10 years old. Now, for the opening speeches, I would like to invite Professor Hünkar Korkmaz to the floor. I would like to thank him for his contribution and efforts uh, for helping us meet in this event for the last three years. And he is the head of our regulatory board of the conference. You are invited to the floor. Thank you very much. Today we are holding this hybrid conference, and this is the third international conference on nutrition, health, literacy, and education. I would like to welcome you to the conference. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity for the opening remarks of this conference. We have participants from various cultures, and there are also participants that are joining us online. But every person should have a good life standard, and in our struggle, We have the same values and understanding. If there was a motto, it would be the following. Food and health for everybody and education for everybody. The theme of our conference, it can be food, health, or education services. As a physiological requirement, nutrition is a basic requirement for each individual and group. But our conference is focusing on this topic despite the efforts of the international arena, because indi individuals are not getting enough nutrition because of the climate crisis, wars, and pandemic obstacles, bottlenecks, and uh, imbalances. Yeah. This is an important warning for the humanity. Peace is lacking, justice is not uh, considered seriously, and the natural environment is destroyed. So basic food requirements are not met, and this is threatening the whole society. Humanity is today is not dealing with the nutrition at the local level. We can only solve it uh, with an international comprehensive approach. The resources must be taken under guarantee, and we should contribute to the responsibilities about the most disadvantaged groups in order to reach these objectives. We should go beyond the borders of the countries and we should focus on real solidarity and we should focus on the sharing of the produced resources and goods. So we need more economic solidarity as a requirement. We have the head of the nutrition and dietetics here. I don't want to talk about this much because they are the experts. But the basic requirement of the human nature is nutrition. This is the biggest physiological requirement. But all... But all the efforts are for that purpose, because if we don't have it, we cannot develop the other aspects of life. Insufficient nutrition is very important for the populations. 
So the individual should undergo an education and training which will support them in this area. So this is a place in the heart of the nutrition uh, curriculum of the schools. The developing countries will be damaged if the training and education in this area cannot be improved, and this will also be an obstacle to reaching the sustainable development goals. Reaching sustainable development goals will um, be focusing on scaling the international aid and the sustainability connections in health, education, and their interdependency um, is known more and there is more awareness about that. Access to uh, qualified education and nutrition is very important for today's generation and for the next generations. If you want to have a sustainable and healthy life, we should understand the problems in this area more. So we should focus on the scientific researches. Scientific researches are of vital importance. So we should cooperate in all these areas in order to ensure that these areas talk to each other. So sustainable development goals are very important in this area. But if we are today, if we are here today, the reason for this is that the education world is facing big challenges. At the same time, of course, this is a challenge with a lot of an extraordinary opportunities. The basic mission of the education systems is to ensure that individuals have a more meaningful and healthy life. This will never change and this cannot change. Only through education, the basic life skills can be improved and we can be employed and we can contribute to the social and economic development of the country and we can be equipped with the skills to do that. And especially regarding these challenges, the education systems should also live up to the uh, updated um, developments of time. The international arena has an open interest in this area. Whichever project you give, whichever article you write, and which, whichever study you look at, you will see that all of these studies are in line with the sustainable development goals defined by the United Nations. And this is the reflection and repercussion of an international effort and activities. We we had a conference in 2022, and more than 300,000 people watched this conference. So, this year we are experiencing a hybrid conference. We have participants from national and international levels. Important experts from respected universities are going to contribute to our conference today. The presentations and the selected topics will provide you opportunity to discuss important issues. I would like to thank Sabri Ulker for the Research Foundation. is known about their role in nutrition and food, but their activities in the area of education are not known very much. In Turkey, a protocol was signed between the Foundation and the Ministry of National Education between 2011 and 2023. According to this protocol, they have been co continuing uh, the Balanced Diet Project. And in this project is focusing on nutrition, health and education in primary schools, and it is focusing on um, improving the knowledge in this area. This project is going to be updated with a new vision and it will increase its target group and it will focus on developing research tools in different and diversified areas. As an output of this project, this conference is focusing on the ideal of sustainable future because it will have important contributions to humanity and it will also improve. Our, we will also talk about the impact on social and economic life. So, we will also focus on the results which are very important. 
Important emphasis in this area will be voiced in this conference. Lastly, at the end of the meeting, we are going to have a concluding declaration of the meeting. So we are going to focus on nutrition, education, and will be emphasized as an important requirement for sustainability. What are we fighting for? We want to be a good ancestor. We, I want to be able to say that my children and my grandchildren have a chance to have a good future. We should revive a multilaterality. We will have to be involved in novelties. We will have to reach new partners. In the areas of development and climate, we should get together and we should improve the situation and we can trigger the enthusiasm in this area once again. I would like to thank you in advance for your contribution, your comments, your support and your opinions. I hope that this is going to be a fruitful meeting. I would like to thank our professors. I would like to thank Sabri Rikar Foundation President, Dr. Talat Ichos, to the floor. Distinguished guests, before I make the opening remarks, I would like to to thank our professor for hosting our foundation in this beautiful university, and I would like to thank you, Mrs. Sunkar, for her nice energy and for uh, supporting us in good projects. I would like to thank her as well. Really, our foundation... is financing an important study in Harvard University. We would like to do a better one in Turkey. However, we could not overcome the legislative problems yet. And I hope we are going to overcome these problems and obstacles in this area. So, we are going to carry out a similar activity or a better activity in Turkey. Distinguished guests, as the head of the Sabri Kair Food Researchers Foundation, I would like to say welcome uh, to everybody who is here with us and who is following us online. And the academicians are carrying out very valuable, valuable activities for social health, and the fact that they are contributing to our conference, um, it is a huge source of proud for us as Sabri Care Foundation that we have these academicians with us. Based on the working principle of Sabri Ülker, the foundation is focusing on raising awareness of the society in the area of healthy nutrition and the foundation is pioneering very important projects. The basic requirements for protecting social health is to provide correct scientific and reliable information to the society in the area of food and education. And there are some myths that should be corrected and Everybody should have the competence of health literacy. To this end, we have gathered experts from various areas and we are aiming our society to gain this competence as Sabri Ulgar Foundation. We are holding our third conference. We have held two more conferences before and we have um, received a lot of interest in those conferences as well. We are going to listen to 
valuable presentations. I will. I hope that they will be a source of inspiration for you. I would like to thank all of you for being with us today, and I wish you a fruitful conference. We would like to thank Dr. Talat Ichers. I would like to invite the first speakers, Ajitapur University Education Faculty, Education Sciences Department, Education Curricula Department staff members, Professor Dr. Yunkar Korkmaz. You are invited to the floor to deliver the presentation on sustainability in school nutrition programs. Um, in each meeting, people say that I move a lot. They say we cannot follow you. As you have seen, I try to stand still. I will just try to do the same because we have online participation and I have to speak to the microphone. This meeting has three pillars. The first one is education. Second one is health. The other one is nutrition. We are in the health pillar. We are representing the education pillar. Today, if I ask the people at this hall, is there anybody who is not getting any nutrition among you? No. In the break, I mean, we have coffee breaks, so we have open stands to meet the nutritional requirement. Is there anybody here who is not interested in his or her health? I think all of you will say, uh, uh, yes, I'm interested in my health. If I ask you this question, I'm not interested in nutrition. The, we have a nutrition and dietetics department. I see graduate and postgraduate students from our department in this. So our department is represented in this hall as well. School-based nutrition program and nutrition education and uh, education and training program. These two concepts can be confused. Sustainable school nutrition programs has a nutrition and dietetics pillar and a health pillar. In most of our projects, in the project called uh, Balanced uh, Balancing Meals uh, Education, we have professors from dietetics and nutrition and education, and also we have the medical professors from Sabri Ulkar Foundation. So in this sense, when we look at it, in this presentation, I will talk about both pillars. When we say school-based nutrition program, we mean providing food to the children and adolescents, regular, healthy, and nutritional food. That's what we mean. And when we say school nutrition education training programs, we mean that... Uh, the teach that the students should learn how to implement the balanced and healthy uh, nutritional principles. So we should develop a common understanding of these two concepts. When we look at the history, in 1946, within the framework of the National School Lunch Law, uh, milk and fruit services have started in the U.S., and this practice has continued in Europe. Especially, the basic objective of this program is to support the students who are living in the regions with a lower socioeconomic situation and to implement uh, breakfast and lunch programs and to increase attendance to school and to increase school success.
If we are talking about a positive school environment with regard to health and nutrition, what would it bring us? It would bring us with the following. The conditions of nutrition and health, if they are fine in a school, in that case, systemic diseases would be falling down in such a school. The risk would be lower. If a student gets sick, uh, he or she infects others, yes. So a strong immunity system will be there and the risks uh, against infection-based uh, diseases would be falling down. And it would bring us with uh, cognitive development and uh, continuity in school. At the same time, if we sum up of all these, if the conditions of health and nutrition are fine, a positive learning environment is there in this school and students will be more eager to continue with education. When it comes to Turkey, in school programs about nutrition education, there have been many studies. And when we have a look at the progress, uh, when it comes to life sciences, uh, it, it has included nutrition as well. At the same time, physical activities and games were included in physical exercise uh, classes. They, this uh, nutrition has been included in such classes. So while uh, fulfilling this project, dietetic balance, uh, content, the content development and having the accurate uh, content uh, was very important for us and the relevant head of the department and uh, the department of research and development, uh, they, they have been very important to us. So I want an applause for all of those who contributed to this field. And at the same time, uh, these two people are very important. They took the ownership of this. And since 1930s, when we have a look at the program since then, uh, it's interesting that sustainable development uh, goals uh, will be handled here in this meeting. There is this uh, primary school program that was issued in 30. So students were taught about, you know, how to do some work in the gardens, on the soil. They contributed to uh, production. Uh, they had this practice at the time because Turkey had this identity of agriculture and husbandry at the time. Societies has have gone through three steps. Uh, um, one is the society of agriculture. What is important is to process soil, to have uh, vegetables, fruit, and uh, providing nutrition conditions that would be adequate for the society. Then came the industry society. Apprenticeship was there, and in, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, equipment were there. And then came the society of information. Access to information is important. Computer and similar devices, electronic devices, uh, came into front, and it uh, the relevant skills came to the forefront and of course education was transformed accordingly. Why did I say this? Interestingly, as years continued, as years went on, we, we saw how agriculture has diminished in these programs. In the first uh, society, agriculture was there, nutrition was there and then it mm -hmm. uh, just vanished. Because these programs are society-based, community-based, uh, they are arranged according to the needs of the societies, needs of the communities. So uh, the programs should be based on the needs of the communities. When we uh, come to 1936, in such a program, in addition to agricultural programs, uh, husbandry was also handled, uh, including nutrition. There is something interesting here. There is no theoretical information provided. It's all practical. Uh, so uh, there are these practice uh, gardens uh, in schools and environmental conditions were considered. We were in such a period that there was no literacy. Young population was lost in the wars and the students coming to school, the students that are schooled uh, were very important to uh, bring up 
when it comes to uh, information and everything were, was was turned into practice at the time so such programs were initiated uh, nature science of nature was handled here so in this class in 1936 they were explaining how uh, bread was made uh, how, what, what sorts of phases it has gone through. When we came to 1936 curriculum, there are some topics when compared to 26. You know, what are there in a shop, uh, in a small shop? Also, entertaining, uh, entertainment activities for winter, new year, military service. Uh, nature that is changing in seasons, how the nutrition chain, uh, chain starts and how it continues. Such activities were provided to students and of course practice was always there, uh, practice in situ. When we came to 1948, In autumn, there were these different things, vegetables, fruit, um, sold in markets, open markets, shops. Uh, these programs were very rich in content. Today, when we compare them, uh, the ones that were produced in the past were much live. Uh, you know, uh, learning takes place with uh, synaptic connections in the brain and what they were doing was more influential than what we are doing today at s schools. Uh, at the time, 1948, these scientific terms were not used, but the programs had these such rich content, like theories were already integralized uh, and they were put into practice. Uh, from the curriculum perspective, to, uh, today, Turkey, unfortunately, it did not have any progress, just the contrary. Uh, you know, political interventions also took place. There are many factors behind that, which is not the, the topic of today's uh, conference. Then came, when should we eat uh, which fruit? Dietitians today are uh, recommending us eat this and that at this and that time of the day. We are paying dietitians for this, but at the time in 1948, they were teaching it in the curriculum at schools. What do our mothers do, make uh, from fruit? Let's eat fruit. Let's not eat the uh, seeds of the fruit, it says. Uh, apple seeds, are they eatable? What does it have? Something like a cyanide, uh, cyanide. And today's children do not know about this. Um, I have seen the relevant disciplinary boards uh, books. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, you feel like emotional when you read those books, actually. That population of poverty, without anything, who were not able to find any funding for their projects, the uh, ac academicians of the time of education wrote down such scientific, such uh, important uh, contents in textbooks. And it says, you know, uh, we shouldn't be throwing away the uh, peels of uh, fruit. And do you know what it continues to say? Uh, you know, we are talking about composts today. These books, textbooks, say that uh, the peels of uh, fruit should be used as fertilizers. And then came, again, all sorts of practices, like they were holding a visit to the garden around and it talks about harms uh, of eating 
uh, things that are not healthy. And it gives some information about production, consumption, distribution, some basic information. And it also talks about health, traffic rules, healthy uh, lifestyle, and uh, uh, food preparation is also mentioned in textbooks of the time. 1968, let's be clean. Uh, how to decide uh, certain food is healthy, how to protect from diseases. Today, salinary is not known by children. And uh, children do not know whether a fruit is uh, uh, okay or not for them, rotten or not. They, they don't uh, have the sense of uh, a taste or smell. They cannot differentiate. They were uh, planting trees. I'm from Amasya. Uh, I graduated there. Amasya used to be a province where there were many gardens around. Vegetables and fruit were attacked by children, insane, and the passengers. There was this uncle Ihsan who did not uh, permit this. Camouflage concept. I learned this from Uncle Ihsan. He didn't let us go into his garden. At the time, we were uh, learning the Crusades. Uh, you know Najar uh, and Chatak, these are the terms used uh, in gardenry uh, about plants. You know, in social sciences classes, we learned. They were, we were split into three groups. The first one was the attackers. The second one, observers, like the, uh, our friends who were letting us know where uh, uncle was there. And people like, uh, children like me who, who were in the uh, back, who were preparing fruit and vegetables. Uh, and I learned photosynthesis from my teacher at the time. He said that the green-leaved uh, plants uh, take salt and other minerals from the soil through their trunk. They transmit it to the uh, leaves and they are turning into oxygen and uh, nutrition. I'm 55 years old I, and I never forgot, forgot this. But he didn't teach us the following. Yeah. Every leaf, uh, green leaf plant that you take away is contributing to reduction of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So uh, this was not turned into a social skill. I did not plant a tree. And uh, you know what we are experiencing today. We did not turn these into practice. Now this uh, problem is leading to people who are contributing to wildfires taking place as people do not have this awareness. Uh, and this is increasing. Uh, and the, uh, the child of the time uh, were planting trees, they were uh, protecting soil, they were protecting the country. In order to consume food, uh, waste was avoided. Yes, planting trees in gardens of schools, being careful about cl uh, uh, clean products was very important. Mm -hmm. At the time, there were no infrastructure. The drinking water was polluted by a savage system. Sanitation was not there uh, in a smooth manner. There were some problems. Mm -hmm. Contagious communicable diseases were there. It's possible to see this in the programs to a large extent, communicable diseases emphasis. And nutrition, health, hygiene are mentioned in this content with a big weight. When we came to 1968, balanced action, uh, open space, getting injured, uh, doing exercises, uh, preparation and transportation of food, freshness, health conditions, nutrition, uh, and manners of eating uh, were mentioned. 
the physicians are warning us that we are eating fast. Uh, we are eating without chewing. So this manner of eating is very important, uh, which was there in the 60s. How to chew a certain piece of food? It's both a manner and also its health, its nutrition. So when we came to 68, uh, the relations, uh, relationships with uh, health professionals, health protection, uh, health institutions around, being careful about drinking water, safe, uh, safety of drinking water, etc., are mentioned. I'm going rapidly here, as of 1995. There are many points mentioned here. These do not present a sincere attitude. They are just written for the sake of being written. As a program writer, I find this important. Yes, they are important and valuable, but these are too general, too generic. I continue health, nutrition and action handled together. The department head of nutrition and dietetics was here and we were discussing about sleep, sleep hygiene, I guess. We were saying, this is the biggest problem of today's children. Children are not able to sleep properly. They are watching the screen until the last minute. There are many sleep disorders. Maybe such expressions can include such points as well. You know, generic expressions should be avoided. More practical things should be incorporated into these textbooks. Emergency, disaster, injuries uh, are also mentioned. When I analyze all these, uh, I have uh, put an emphasis on how to give this to students. Of course, content should be prepared in such a way that it should contribute to other disciplines, nutrition, education, chemistry also, biology. Many things would be included. And in the basis of all these different aspects, independent lifestyles also should be uh, emphasized and uh, hazards should be avoided. School-based nutrition education, what should be there? Actually, I learned this from the Balanced Nutrition Project. Meral Professor was responsible for Antalya, uh, one of the most efficient provinces ever worked in this project. I would like to extend my thanks to her uh, on behalf of myself and students. What I learned from her is uh, the fields of interest of students should be focused on. There are these uh, regional discrepancies. Teachers uh, are uh, uh, behaving differently when it comes to programs. They are not taking the ownership of uh, things that are outside of their program. So these should be integrated in the programs. Minister of National Education, you know, this project starts in 2011 and in 2014, they say that there must be a programmer here. And then in 2014, a program development expert, myself, I was included in this program. And as of 2014, we, uh, we had a big acceleration. Uh, we have scaled up to 20 uh, provinces with school-based, you know, the studies that are not consistent with school programs. They are not easy to incorporate. Uh, all these efforts should be incorporated into the programs. And we have to consider the things that are uh, doable by the students. The realities of children shouldn't be ignored. Uh, access to healthy and good food is very important. And culturally appropriate food should be there as much as possible in activities. Regional emphasis should be made in our books. We uh, incorporated them.
it was there in the program as well. Uh, of course, we want to improve the habits, healthy nutrition habits of children. We want to strengthen these skills and knowledge. I'm thankful to Professor Elif for this. She contributed to us. She forced us. The, our material uh, was revised significantly. It was a big honor. It has been a big honor for me to have collaborated uh, with her. I would like to thank her for uh, all these efforts and for being here also. Elif. They say K4. I, I say A4 for that. Feza, Professor Feza taught me this. Actually, I learned it from her. Balanced nutrition, selection of food, conditions of cleaning, hygiene, healthy lifestyle, uh, different needs, lifestyles, uh, food of different cultures are provided at A4, grade 4. In uh, between 5 to 8, uh, food content, healthy, balanced nutrition, how to cook, uh, food health, safety, storing, symptoms, etc. And high school, in addition to these, uh, cultural and religious so uh, options, agriculture, health, ecology, nutrition, skills, and habits are also added up on this. In the context of sustainable education, what do we say? First of all, we talked about the program. There are some practices about school meals. Through these programs, students are able to uh, make their individual and collective uh, selections. Uh, and uh, today there are such, you know, circulars, directives in order to avoid obesity and uh, in order to avoid health problems uh, like stuntedness. Uh, there are some problems still in the school programs. We were not able to scale up these efforts. The integrity of the planet uh, the problems that are threatening the welfare of human beings and the uh, health of human beings. These are very important. Awareness raising is focused on. For the first time ever in a report, uh, the capability to meet the needs of today's people. Uh, and in that regard, sustainable development, this expression is used in this report. I guess this report is based on uh, 2010. When it comes to sustainability, we are re remembering Mustafa uh, all, all the time. So sustainable uh, nutrition education, we say. Sustainability is split into three. Social sustainability environmental sustainability and the third one do you know our young people colleagues do you know economic sustainability so lately however uh, cultural sustainability is also added up on this and education stands there let me say so when it comes to sus social sustainability we are talking about a livable society a healthy society equality, diversity, social integrity, life quality, democracy, and governance. Such criteria are there. Environmental sustainability. We are teaching children how to reduce uh, uh, food waste. You remember 1930s? It was there in a rich program. Uh, when I was in the Singapore program, I was impressed by the following. The programs of the previous times uh, are complemented. We should be adding up new things and we should uh, revise the good things. Actually, this is something that we are failing. Every new cadre of ministry uh, is ignoring what was done in the past. And uh, they are uh, making uh, they are talking badly about what was done in the past. So, uh, mon uh, watching what was done, 
what is being done is very important. If you want to develop further, you need to be aware of what's happening in the world, in the country. And here, the main role of education is very important, of course. From economic perspective, school food, what, how can we associate it to development? It is there, of course. They are buying products from the producers nearby, cooperation with different sectors. And of course, uh, school nutrition programs are very important when it comes to sustainability. So from these points on, social, environmental, economic dimensions are very important when we are talking about sustainability. This is not something new to us. We did not give this word, but we did this, sustainability, in our programs in 1930s. The only problem that we have got is we have this weakness of forgetting our past. Just shortly, something that would be interesting for the nutrition department students. I would like to talk about what's being done around the globe. In the UK, uh, increasing the quality of food consumed and procured in schools uh, are there to develop the education and health of youth. And today, this, uh, we have got this Ülker Foundation and this, there is a foundation here as well. They made up an organization in that regard. Catering companies were used for school food. So uh, it was outsourced. Or some students were uh, bringing their food from home. In France, uh, again, uh, healthy food, high quality food. Uh, at lunch, they found out that uh, the food, uh, the uh, rate of oil and protein was low, and uh, they worked on this, and uh, the ministry is there, Ministry of Education and Research, uh, they made some directives, and uh, they stopped use of machines, automatic machines, uh, If a child does not have a breakfast, uh, the child is given breakfast at least two hours before lunch. When it comes to Italy, they are focusing on organic food and sustainability to a large extent. Uh, agricultural practices, diets, culture uh, are important for them. And they guarantee this with a law of finance uh, and the government makes investment in uh, relevant equipment and food uh, services. Those aged between 2 and 14 are sitting around a table with tablecloth and the relevant equipment, uh, including silver uh, belongings and uh, teachers also are also included three services are provided in Finland uh, manners of eating are there uh, traditions are taught and uh, food is provided to children free of charge uh, private companies are used for catering and uh, Packaged food are not allowed. In UK, uh, United States, health and welfare is emphasized uh, to attain the objectives. There is a law and it is applied. When it comes to Turkey, as a matter of fact, in Turkey, some documentation, some directives were prepared and people worked on this. And the, these are the topics uh, used the menu management, inspection uh, processes, supply, storing, production, distribution, and uh, post service. Uh, 
and the principals of schools are responsible parties. If needed, of course, ministry can be expecting the inspection mechanisms to be in place uh, five days a week. Cultural and social needs are emphasized. So, I won't be repeating myself. I know that I am behind my schedule. Just to sum up. Why should we prepare a nutrition program for schools, a sustainable program? Environmental nutrition development perspectives in this. Uh, adequate, safe nutrition uh, effects are very important. You see the SDGs here. How about which ones are relevant to the school nutrition programs? Almost half of them. Number two, number three, you know, stop poverty, health and quality life, uh, high quality education, clean water sanitation, uh, decent work, economic growth, sustainable cities, communities, responsible protection, consumption, climate. <clears throat> Last two slides. What are the outcomes, outputs, outputs of this nutrition program? You have to make sure that we have the sustainable kitchen uh, food waste management. Uh, behavior change should be there. Uh, sustainable urban planning, agricultural land use, uh, local economy and employment about food, sustainable integrated governance. Politics. Politics, again, politics. All efforts, all jobs done in Turkey, decision, planning, implementation, evaluation mechanisms, monitoring mechanisms, consistency of politic, uh, policies is very important. Just as an example, last year a nutrition program was initiated, it was drawn back and it was uh, started again. We need to be consistent there, and it takes a strong political leadership. It has many sectors, education, health, agriculture, local administration, interaction and communication is very important for that. Local uh, agriculture and uh, farming are very important. We are turning the world into concrete. Today's children are getting sick very quickly. Their muscles are not as developed as those in the past. They are eating an apple, but uh, how about the nutrition effects of an ap apple today or a tomato today? I'm not sure as an ordinary person. This is your field. We will be listening to the experts of this field. We have to uh, uh, encourage local productions. A consistent, realistic finance and management capacity should be there, and uh, database management is very important. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. We have learned from Mrs. Sunkar how important the school nutrition programs can be. We would like to thank her. Our schools are really very important in terms of getting healthy life habits after the family. Now I would like to invite Associate Professor Mustafa Öztürk from Boğaziçi University Education Faculty. He will talk about sustainable division in education. You are invited to the floor. He was involved in the organization board of our conference, and I would like to thank him for his efforts in the organization of this conference. Uh, it will be difficult for me to speak here because there is a lot I mean, as actually, there's a lot to say, but the previous speaker has mentioned a lot, a lot of the things that I am going to mention. I will mention sustainability in a more general manner, and I will talk about integration between sustainability and education.
The issue of sustainability, as was mentioned by the previous speakers, is on the agenda for the last 40 years, but mainly in the last 10 years. In the companies, institutions, and schools, and in the conferences, we hear this term as an, as an important theme. And after the Declaration of the Sustainable Development Goals, we are seeing this concept all the time. But is this really a new concept? As Mrs. Sunkar mentioned, this is not a very new term. For many years throughout the history, we have implemented this concept and phenomenon in our education system and nutrition system. But unfortunately, some cultures are better in conceptualizing these terms. Actually, we know those terms and they are just conceptualizing it and marketing it back to us. We see similar things in education. For example, in 1940s, we were implementing an internal, we have internalized a topic, but now we can just hear about it as a new topic. When we say, what is sustainability? This is the answer to the question of what kind of a world do we want? Each answer that you are going to give and all the lists that you're going to prepare as a brainstorming will be the answer of sustainable and it is a very wide concept. In its essence, as was mentioned by the previous speakers, we should meet the requirements of the existing generation in such a way not to limit the opportunities of meeting the requirements of the future generations. It's a type of development. It's a world uh, vision. This is the definition in the Brundtland report that Mrs. Sunkar mentioned. So we're saying the same thing, but with different ter terms and words. When we look at the phenomena that are covered by this concept, this is not only a type of development, it is also a world vision. It's an understanding of welfare, it's a universal value, it's a lifestyle, it's a social movement. Sustainability can also be considered and named, it should be named as a social movement. Whose job is to ensure sustainability? We're talking about it. There is such a development type. Whose responsibility should be to do this? Who should be held accountable for that? There are different ideas about that. Governments, some say governments. Of course, governments come the first, then institutions, individuals, families, NGOs, international organizations, or the business world. Who is going to assume responsibility about this? Where do the educators stand in this? Actually, they are in the heart of it. When we think about ownership and account accountability of sustainability, we see that the educators are at the heart of this responsibility. This is a joint responsibility. Sustainability is not only the duty and responsibility of the business world, the governments, institutions, or individuals and families. All the stakeholders in the society should have ownership of this. And we should have this joint vision and responsibility in our social uh, spaces and uh, private spaces. So based on this, when we look at the repercussions of sustainability to education, we can say that sustainability is a global vision of education. It is not only at the local level, regional level, or in our region. It will not be limited to it. And you're following it from the recent developments. All the world is talking about this. This is a transdisciplinary concept. As Mrs. Sunkar mentioned, if we say environmental sustainability, financial and cultural sustainability, and sustainability in education. For example, today we are here for nutrition. We are talking about nutrition and health sustainability, but tomorrow we can talk about agriculture and city planning related to sustainability. So we have to have ownership because it is transdisciplinary. 
There's another aspect of it, which is intergenerational justice. We always give a similar example, but when we look at the lifestyle today, we know that this will affect the world um, of our grandchildren. Let's give an example from the water cycle. The water that we drink today, if it is the same water that the philosopher drank, so we have to ensure an intergenerational justice. Another aspect of it is transboundary responsibility. I have watched a study about this on TV in Antarctica, in the um, uh, icebergs and in the glaciers. They carried out a study and they made an analysis on the seawater and they've seen that. They have discovered plastics from 60 different regions of the world. So, the water that you are drinking and the bottle of your water can be seen in North America. So, the same thing goes for the wastes. We are living in a period where the wastes are being exported between countries. And it is also a common goal for equity, and it's a rational approach to the future. We are discussing today past and the future. What are we going to do in the future? What is our um, thought and opinion about future? Again, sustainability comes to the forefront. I am referring to Mrs. Sinkar. There are three main pillars of sustainability, ecological uh, sensitivity, social transformation, economic development. Last, in the recent times, we have also added cultural diversity. But we should also focus on the joint areas of these pillars. For example, where there is ecology and economy, we have a green production and a cyclical economy and circular economy, sorry. And between cultural diversity and economic development, we have social justice and uh, equal opportunities for everybody. And between social transformation and cultural diversity, we have so social inclusion. And uh, between social transformation and ecological sensitivity, we have ecological justice and healthy life. And we are today here for healthy life. How can we have, how can we reflect it? To education. We said it's a joint responsibility and it should be reflected to education. We can discuss this in many aspects, but I tried to gather it under six headings. Education policies and practices, as Mr. Sunkar mentioned, if we do not include this in our policies, if we cannot incorporate it into implementations, we cannot succeed. Secondly, learning environments and physical environment. If we think about our schools and learning environments as a whole, if the sustainable division is not reflected there, then there will be shortcomings. And if a topic is not included in the curricula, the teacher will not mention it. So sustainability should be necessarily incorporated into curricula. Measurement, assessment, and evaluation processes. Unfortunately, we have a test-focused examination system, so this is kind of in the second priority. If we cannot measure and evaluate uh, a skill, a competence, then we, the students cannot gain this competence. Another area is human resources and capacity building. We mean all the stakeholders about education here, and lastly, Developing cooperation and partnerships, as well as these areas. We have the student dimension and teacher dimension. In the teacher dimension, vocational development and qualifications must be focused on. Especially, we have to empower and strengthen and support students so that they can have ownership and uh, joint responsibility. At the, at the student level, there are some key skills and competences that they have to get, acquired. We have to empower the youth and we have to mobilize them. 
Let me give you an example about teacher and student areas. Sustainable life style, which is a part of the vision, can be reflected on basic themes. Seven or eight experts from various countries uh, have carried out a brainstorming, and I was also involved, and we have come up with seven areas when we say uh, this we I mean how should we reflect sustainable lifestyle the answers were like this responsible consumption interaction with nature utilization of renewable energy sustainable life areas sustainable mobility which is transportation sustainable waste practices and sustainable nutrition these are the first seven areas of sustainable lifestyle. Yes, sustainable nutrition is one of the basic components, as you see. When we think about students and teachers, what do we expect from the students regarding this? We want the student to think and feel and implement this. We don't want only a cognitive learning in the social and uh, emotional level. The student should feel it so that he or she will implement. So knowing is not sufficient. We should also have processes that will make the students feel and implement. At the uh, teacher front, in order for the student to be able to do this, the role of this teacher is to raise awareness, to sensitize, and to mobilize them, to trigger them to take action. So, in these areas, regarding education policies and implementation area, sustainability should not be uh, considered only at one level. Mrs. Hünkar said instead of K, uh, he, he, she will use A. For example, it is not only limited to A12. We know the, the problems and shortcomings and deficit in the vocational education and training. Throughout the world, uh, countries are investing in TWET programs for green transformation. We should also reflect this to our policies. Secondly, lifelong learning. L Education will not be stopped when we are going from preschool education to higher education. We should not ignore vocational and technical training, and we should ensure that this is a lifelong learning. Secondly, learning environments and physical environment. Actually, we know these terms, um, but there's an approach in which these things that we learn are conceptualized and provided to us. A whole school approach, when you enter a school, when you walk in the corridor, when you look at the walls and windows, everything in the school, up to the trash box, if this vision is reflected in all these aspects, then they have the whole school approach. If it is only in the policy or curricula, it will be lacking. And universal design is something that we discuss Fair utilization, access to education, and flexibility in utilization must be reflected to learning outcome, learning environments. Thirdly, green schools in 1940s and 60s, the schools had their own orchards and gardens. Today, projects are being devised as you know, great project ideas. For example, having an orchard in a school and making compost or raising animals there or producing eggs. Today, there are projects that are being devised about them, but before, everything was existing naturally. The other element is inclusive school, which does not have discrimination. Everybody has fair and equitable access. Sustainable complex.
So sustainable campuses, for example, storm water is distilled and used, and they are producing their own energy. And the last one is outdoor learning environments. I mean, out of school learning environments, actually. So because of bureaucracy and uh, urbanization, our children uh, cannot learn in out-of-school environments. We should focus on that as well. So we talked about curricula and textbooks. When we look at the individual as a whole, we should provide a knowledge, understanding, attitude, value, action, and application to the individuals. And we need a balance when doing that. Sometimes we focus on knowledge a lot, so values are not given necessary importance. Mr. Sunkara gave examples. In the curricula, we see that there is the concept there is a concept of, we look at uh, learning outcomes about nutrition and climate. They mention the teams, so the, the student can define the importance of sustainability or, or can explain the reasons of climate change, explains, expresses, uh, cla <laughs> classifies and lists. This is only cognitive, but we should also have values and attitudes which will help the students to internalize us. This, I mean, the student knows the importance of doing compost. This is something, but can the student make it at home? He should be able to do that. In the measurement and assessment and evaluation processes, if something is not measured, then it, it will not be successful. We have a multiple choice system. We are condemning our students to this uh, contest-based, competition-based system. There are some programs which have different uh, systems. There are some schools which follow the national program and different modules. When I look at those students, I feel that they are kind of stuck. They don't want to be away from the Turkish context because there is a very competition-based examination system. and. They also want to be trained as international citizens. If we don't focus, if we don't shape our education system in such a way to measure these key skills, then it will be only superficial. Maybe it will be in the curricula, in a textbook, but when you put a very important examination in front of the student, he will not be thinking about strategic or critical thinking or systemic thinking. Sustainability focuses on these types of competences and key skills. Self-awareness, flexibility, adaptation, resilience, normative competency, anticipatory competency, um, communication, collaboration, problem solving. So we should be able to ensure that the students have acquired these learning outcomes and we should be able to measure them. Human resources and capacity building. So first we have to focus on cognition. Cognition means what we know, what we believe in. So if we combine these three, this means cognition. What do we understand from something? What do we believe about that? If we have to make our co cognition open, we can integrate it with our beliefs and values and should change our perspectives. The questions that we ask will be very important here. What kind of questions are we going to ask to ourselves? When we say human resources and capacity, we mean the students that we're going to train. And we're talking about all the stakeholders. Individual um courage is also important in getting this vision. Okay, there is something like that, but to what extent I can do something? We have to show uh, some courage. We have to be brave. The third 
element is self-change. It is important to give instructions, but have we changed really? There are important activities about this. Teachers in their personal areas, social areas, and professional areas, uh, to what extent are they carrying out these behaviors? If the teacher is also um, separating the waste at source at home, if the teacher shows sustainable behaviors in mass transportation and at school with his students, then this means that the teacher can be a role model and he had self-change, so we have to ensure that consistency. Lastly, cooperation and developing, developing partnerships. We have to have partnerships. Today we are here as an output of a partnership from health, from nutrition and education, from money, from universities and from the foundation. We have people from various units and we have established a partnership. So, we have to assume joint responsibility. We have to have that joint awareness. And uh, we have to emphasize cooperative action. We have talked about individual courage. And we, we have to have a reasonable social awareness. So, uh, we want to reinstate this reasonable society awareness. So, we need to have that ownership internalization. So, in a nutshell, for a better world, for a better world, we need open cognition, individual courage, self-change, reasonable society awareness, joint responsibility, and cooperative action. Maybe we can disseminate and develop sustainable vision and education. Thank you very much for listening to me. We would like to thank Associate Professor Mustafa Osterk for his contribution and presentation. The next speech is titled The Role of Dietitians in Sustainable Food Systems. I would like to invite Professor Dr. Zehra Bitunja Demira from Ajitapa University, Department of Nutrition and Dietetics. Yes, please. First of all, I would like to thank Sabri Ülker Foundation of Food Research Institute. We are thankful to them for uh, this hosting. Uh, and I would like to greet all the audience, physically present and online audience also. I would like to declare that I don't have any uh, conflict of interest. This is the content of my presentation. I would like to handle a few points. First of all, what is sustainable food system? Why do we need a transformation in this? And what are the roles of dietitians in this transformation? What has been done in the world and in Turkey and what needs to be done? This is a presentation around these topics. When we say sustainable nutrition or sustainable food systems, actually we have started to, to hear this expression within the last decade or 15 years time, just as the professors put it. The most basic components of the education, as the students of Aisha Baisal professor, the, that sustainability, that those waste management, that we had such messages during our student times. Uh, after so long years, uh, we started to see these concepts with this expression of sustainability. Then we have a look at the practices in Turkish cuisine. We have got many um, relevance relevant points actually uh, but as a concept having this in the literature and having this definition uh, 
took such time. You know, we have been discussing this within the last 15 years time, but the rationale behind this dates uh, more back. Uh, the, uh, most, the most fundamental uh, human right, access to adequate food, uh, the right to adequate food. This was mentioned uh, in 48, and then it was revised in 66, 99. Uh, everybody has the right to adequate food. This is a human right, and it needs to be ensured. This right is not about uh, being full or having this energy. Social life, cultural life is also there. This should be ensured in a way that will encompass the, those fields as well. When we have a look at the globe, we see that this is this right is not exercised. Malnutrition is all around the world. It affects different regions. It has got different forms. 155 million children are stunted today. Uh, 52 million children are too thin uh, for height. And obesity prevalence is increasing significantly. Chronic diseases are increasing, or the uh, uh, iodine uh, inadequacy, zinc inadequacy, these are important problems. So this fundamental human right cannot be exercised as the globe. Not about economic dimension only, but for both developing and underdeveloped countries the uh, malnutrition is there this is the biggest global public health issue cardiovascular prevalence cancer prevalence when we consider all these different things 51 million mortality is taking place from non-communicable diseases. So this is a big load on all countries. This malnutrition is very important. Why do we have malnutrition? It has got this economic dimension, socio-demographic factors, biologic factors, and environmental factors, which is very important. And food systems are very important in environmental factors. The uh, uh, production, the way they are marketed, uh, cultural, social properties, urban or rural uh, living conditions, globalization, all these uh, sub factors are there. And we have these uh, 820 million people that are sleeping in hunger. And uh, this uh, food insecurity is prevalent uh, for more than 1.3 billion human beings. So this is a global problem. You see the marked increases with regard to this. At the moment, FAO FAO says uh, the production is enough uh, to meet the needs of the whole human beings around the globe, but we cannot make use of this. Climate change, environment deg degradation, Biodiversity losses, uh, problems with regard to access to natural resources, population increase, migration, urbanization, etc. are there. Four components, uh, rice, wheat, uh, corn and potato are uh, the first four. Uh, for as uh, food items for, for human beings. So there were thousands, thousands of different, uh, you know, food, but it has been decreased to four now. This is very important with urbanization, with the migration taking place. On one hand, we are making the malnutrition chronic, and at the same time, we are consuming the health of the world, and this is a hazard for the future of our planet. So the better the world is, the better the food uh, systems will be there. Just as the professor was saying, the apple is not the same as uh, 60 years back. Where we have got soil uh, uh, pollution. We have got the losses of uh, uh, land. Uh, on the other hand, when we consider the food systems, are we going to be having the same world, same uh, planet, so this is a dual relationship, actually. Uh, resources are decreasing. This has an effect on food systems. A, a waste of uh, food 
systems is very hazardous for the future of the planet. So we need to provide a solution to this interaction for our uh, future and for our uh, uh, grandchildren's future. Production of food up to the waste, that cycle is important. Production of food, collection, processing, packaging, distribution, marketing, and the uh, end user having it, the, uh, the way of uh, consumption and the waste taking place, all this cycle, uh, I take it as the food system. At each phase, we are harming the planet because the greenhouse, uh, uh, when we have a look at it, uh, emissions, it's coming from the food production. 26% uh, of emissions come from food and 50% of the world's habitable land is used for agriculture, 70% of global freshwater withdrawals are used for agriculture, biodiversity is decreasing rapidly, uh, so um, making use of different resources is there for food. If we continue with this performance, uh, the ever-increasing population will be putting another factor uh, into the uh, negative effects. We uh, have this ecosystem relationship here with agriculture, manufacturing, distribution, retail and end user. And you see the resources, influences, uh, and the transfer of the processed food packaging. Uh, we are using materials. Uh, it's going to be having an effect on pollution. We are storing it. What is the energy source? What is the load on the nature and marketing of it in the markets? Energy use, equipment use. So we consume it and then uh, it goes to waste. So one uh, third of the food are, uh, is waste. So the waste is huge. Uh, so we need to consider a re revision of this cycle actually. Today, the future of the world and the future of the human health interact on food system. Uh, this is put in sustainable uh, uh, development goals in the Paris Climate Agreement. This was declared. So uh, this is very important for the planet, for the human beings' health. This is not about uh, politicians only. Just as Mustafa Yilmaz was mentioning, we should uh, keep an eye on ourselves uh, to take actions. Of course, strategic steps should be taken also. There is a risk at the moment. Uh, people are going to sleep in hunger. Uh, in 2050, the po world population is expected to be 10 billion and the pollution is taking place. It's a very significant amount. So we need a transformation in food systems. Uh, we need to have sustainable systems there. Uh, this is clearly set with guidelines. FAO, WHO, the Climate Council made uh, some studies in this regard. And we have got this authority also here, just shown. Uh, the planet diet, uh, food planet health, they uh, provide such different concepts. There are two concepts. One is sustainable nutrition, the other sustainable food systems. When we say sustainable nutrition, uh, environmental impact is low, affordable, culturally appropriate, uh, uh, safe, etc. Uh, this is a model, actually. This uh, concept is going to be elaborated in the afternoon session, so I would like to continue with the food systems. Food systems, just as mentioned by the previous uh, speakers, it's about uh, uh, food security for all uh, and uh, of course, economic, social, and environmental aspects are very important. Uh, we should organize the food system in such a way that equity should be there when it comes to distribution of food. As you know, food insecurity uh, is mentioned in different sources, and this is very important as a pillar there. And of course, it's important to consider the future while doing all these things. 
There are three components mentioned in sustainability, already mentioned by the previous speakers. When we consider these, actually, uh, let's, uh, let us emphasize four pillars, not three. So uh, environmental components, social, cultural, ethical components, uh, nutrition, health components, economic components, which uh, help us to achieve sustainable, healthy uh, food systems. So our beliefs, our cultural values, ethic, uh, ethics are very important. Uh, and the uh, food systems should be uh, observing this. Environmental components, use of water, use of soil, biodiversity being protected are very important. Economic components are also defined there. And what we do is our role should be, of course, defined in this regard. And these four different pillars should be considered while making policies. FAO report uh, shows that from consumption to waste in this cycle, environmental conditions, socioeconomic conditions, uh, cultural uh, conditions, uh, they all form such a cycle here, mentioned here, uh, food system is quite complicated. Uh, dietitians or other disciplines uh, cannot uh, be the only uh, uh, discipline. It requires a significant amount of cooperation. Where do we stand as dietitians? What is our role? When you have a look at this, uh, you know, the, uh, we have got the belly, uh, bellies, uh, when we say uh, dietitians, uh, uh, that's what we think. In the definition of dietitians, we have got a waste area of work. Uh, it's about the supply uh, chain. You know, Hajetepe hospitals are around us at the moment. Obesity clinics, we don't have. Endocrinology clinics uh, has it, this unit. Uh, many diseases like cancer, allergies, a, a large spectrum is there. Nutrition treatment is provided in this discipline. This is uh, one of the things that we are doing. In addition to that, development of community health is very important for us. Uh, from children to the elderly, we are making planning of nutrition. We are working in the food industry. We, we have this uh, role of communication when it comes to food. Health and nutrition is taken to the center uh, thanks to our efforts. Uh, this is very important. And uh, wherever collective uh, nutrition is, dietitians has, have to be included. Today in hosp uh, hospital of Hacettepe, uh, in uh, five-star hotels or uh, the elderly pension uh, um, houses, many different locations dietitians uh, are uh, working. Educational institutions, academics, uh, also research institutions, ministries, actually Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry are the first uh, two uh, ministries. But we are even counseling to the Ministry of Interior Affairs, media uh, institutions and sports uh, associations are who we have been providing uh, support when it comes to uh, the field of dietitians. And this multidisciplinary team uh, is very important. We are a part of this team. So a cooperation is very important as a matter of fact. Uh, this is uh, quite important. And these are the fields of work for us. Growing, harvesting, transporting, processing, packaging, wholesaling, retailing, eating, waste. Uh, the role of dietitians. When we have a look at this role, uh, actually our professional organizations are defining some uh, skills and capabilities in the supply, institutions, uh, nutrition, care, uh, health development, community health development, management, research, in addition to the communication, cooperation and professional practices. Uh, nutrition and dietetics uh, in, in this field, sustainability approach needs to be integrated. Uh, there are significant efforts in this regard. When it comes to professional practices, the main output is health. So we want to make this contribution. But when we integrate sustainability, 
what the counselor says is, yes, health is the main output, but in order to attain it, the health of the planet and social equity should also be considered. Did we think about this? Yes, as students of uh, Aisha Baisal, uh, we used to have this uh, approach. What is the cost of this diet, uh, she would ask us. Or are you going to be able to give this diet to the patients in the uh, uh, low socioeconomic conditions, she would say us when we were students. So we have to provide, of course, such conditions. And our students also know this clearly. We used to do this, but we need to be making use of some tools, some evaluation skills. Uh, we need to be doing this more efficiently now. Of course, making proper use of terminology, development of relevant tools, use of uh, these tools by the professionals, evidence-based approach being in the core, these are very important. Uh, evidence-based uh, approach uh, is very important to have and we should be struggling against dissemination of wrong uh, information or misinformation. And of course, uh, we also have a role of uh, teaching people uh, about different uh, points. Uh, in addition, we have this role of uh, establishing partnerships, establishing relationships uh, with different disciplines, with uh, other sectors when it comes to sustainability. Uh, this is the case for all ITians working in different fields. We need to have a coordination. Uh, American Academy about uh, nutrition uh, uh, made a list about who to have a partnership uh, you know, producer, supplier, doctor, teachers, uh, everybody in different disciplines should be included. Sustainability is not a field uh, where one discipline can work uh, in. The third point is nutrition and care process, I said. While preparing uh, diets, we need to have adopt a different approach uh, while making the relevant evaluation. We should have a look into whether the adequacy is there of the nutrition. But in addition to that, uh, we need to consider the planet as well. And while making recommendations about the preferences of food or making a program, sustainability should be considered. And uh, we need to be making some uh, clear uh, identifications like uh, red meat consumption. Uh, when we decrease it to once in a week from five uh, times a week, a greenhouse gas emission would be reduced to a significant, at a significant amount. Or, uh, so the change in uh, eating habits is very important for protection of air and protection of soil. While making plannings of nutrition, you should be uh, taking this into consideration. Health is a very important dimension. We will be doing that, of course, but from that uh, window when we do that the environmental health uh, should also be considered as well as sustainability of course making use of efficient uh, tools is also important when it comes to community health protection uh, of course partnership with the policymakers is uh, uh, valuable uh, Hajatipa University Department of Diet uh, was established in 65 and as of today it was set up uh, you know they prepared the guidelines and these guidelines uh, and this unit in this department is still very important in our roles sustainability should be in the score of all the things that we are doing or making use of relevant tools for nutrition education should be there food literacy environmental literacy these are very important sine qua non and the relevant <coughs> part about management this is very important uh, avoiding uh, waste uh, making a proper use of energy and water and waste management, uh, relevant equipment being in use, uh, sustainable cooperation with the suppliers and the whole kitchen uh, personnel uh, should uh, should have integrated an approach, uh, such an approach actually. About research, 
we have to be there when it comes to the research about sustainability and learning from others should also be used. Evidence-based approach is very important in research, of course. Uh, this should be adopted for positive science. The knowledge uh, prepared with evidence-based approach is uh, crucial uh, for dietitians. Actually, this is how uh, United States put it. Education, research, implementation policies, practice policies. Uh, so, uh, recommendations should be prepared with sustainability perspective, uh, uh, food sec uh, security, uh, food chain optimization, waste management. These are mentioned here. Where do we stand? As dietitians, are we doing this? So international authorities in this field uh, have uh, identified these different roles for dietitians. So mm -hmm. your current roles should be developed accordingly, they say. So uh, do they do dietitians uh, feel themselves uh, effective in this regard? This data came from United States last month, the first national data, dietitians' attitude about uh, sustainability. Every nine in ten dietitians believe that sustainability should be incorporated into what they've been doing. There is this belief, but only 69% in the United States, I would like to remind you, uh, where, you know, sustainable, the concept of sustainability is there already. 69% uh, of dietitians said they do not uh, feel confident about sustainability in their job. This research was uh, conducted in uh, 1,171 people, and only 13% of these people uh, get an education about this. And integration is uh, seems to be only in 42% of these people. So less than half of the population uh, do not feel efficient in this regard. 69% already do not have the self-confidence about this. So uh, the results of the research uh, will show that education should be strengthened. Uh, so uh, recommendation development is also going to be important. Revisions uh, need to take place, it says, in the results part, conclusions part. Uh, we have got two important uh, organizations. One includes all associations, uh, international Dietetics, dietetics uh, uh, uh, Confederation, uh, ICDA members, there are 47 uh, national uh, associations, Turkey is included here. Education material were considered to, from a perspective of sustainable to our guideline, Actually, 23 among 47 uh, has such uh, documents, you know, in line with the relevant principles. And 12 of them has a declaration. And Turkey is among us, uh, among those. It's green in color. But only the principle has been defined here in Turkey. It has not been integralized yet. Uh, when the study was issued, it was not there. But we have got good news. I will be sharing it very soon. From the research uh, perspective, there are important, uh, significant uh, number of research when it comes to sustainable food. What is the situation in Turkey? I was a postgraduate uh, evaluating uh, research. I was included. Uh, more than 1,300 students were there. 876 uh, of them were from the diet department. We also had others. So, uh, as a matter of fact, the concept of sustainable nutrition, 84% uh, of them heard about this. Uh, we gave a score, you know, to see the accuracy of this information. 42% uh, of dietetics uh, uh, students uh, heard about it, uh, and 31% of the others, uh, other students. Were. And uh, we accessed to different uh, university students, you know, based on university, based on class, based on the region they are living. 
this was conducted and we wanted to see how they uh, they get their nutrition uh, sustainability awareness is in uh, uh, proportion direct proportion uh, with uh, uh, you know awareness in uh, eating habits uh, this was important to uh, see how about the globe United States, Canada, Australia, uh, associations mainly, sustainable uh, nutrition guidelines are there and dietitians are using them in their practice. Uh, there is this need uh, identified. There are two tools, ICDs, uh, ICDAs developed this tool last year. Uh, I would uh, uh, recommend our student uh, audience here to uh, have a look at this website. I firmly suggest you do it. Their material is quite good. And I, we thought whether it should be translated into Turkish. Uh, and they uh, had a, a welcoming approach in that. That's what we are planning. The second one is EFAT. Uh, European uh, Federation. Uh, I'm in the advisory board. EFAT learning activity is there and some sort of educational material is being developed and it, this is uh, sustainability in dietetics is among the three uh, what they are doing. You are just becoming a member there and you can see the approach about sustainability and how it can be transferred to the field of uh, dietetics. I would uh, recommend you to have a look at that. What is the situation in Turkey? What is, what is it like? The first time it was, uh, you know, sustainability has been integrated into the guidelines is 2022. Our guideline has been revised in December last year. Uh, there is this chapter 9 now added in 22 and it has got this sustainable uh, nutrition as a concept. It is there as a definition, as a principle, but in my view, in other parts of the nutrition uh, guidelines, this needs to be integrated more. Uh, the same thing is mentioned in the guidelines of the US also says this. This is a need, they say, last month. And in time, of course, such studies would be carried out. How about the educational efforts taking place? The core educational program was uh, requested to be revised by the Higher Education Board. Uh, as a member uh, of that commission, I, VV actually uh, uh, wants us to make sure that it's included in all topics. Uh, the 21st uh, century skills should include this. Uh, so all the learning uh, out Foods should be including the sustainability approach. At the moment, these uh, results are fine, but uh, hopefully they are going to be much better in time. Graduate, postgraduate programs will have sustainable nutrition classes. Multidisciplinary postgraduate programs will have this as well. And lifelong learning framework uh, will also be incorporating this. Uh, in the Dietetics Congress that we want to hold last uh, next year, we'll also be having a specific session on sustainability in nutrition, and it's uh, exciting for us. Uh, I wanted to check how many uh, theses are there. Uh, the number is 13 when it comes to the uh, sustainability nutrition, sustainable nutrition. And the, uh, it gives uh, 327 uh, results. Uh, the first one uh, was done in 2017. So, conclusions. The health of human beings, the health of planet is under risk. We need to be considering this. We need to be protecting the health of human beings and the planet. We need a transformation for that. Our field is this transformation in the food systems, in the traditional systems, while making sure that this transformation takes place. Sociocultural, economic, environmental, nutrition, health dimensions should be revised, should be considered, and dietitians should adopt uh, key roles in this transformation of nutrition and food systems. There is a big progress needed. 
uh, like uh, professional practices, communication, cooperation, nutrition, care process. This role has been clar clearly identified by the UK in Australia also. Sustainable dietitian definition has appeared already. So uh, specialization is taking place, of course. But before specialization, each dietitian sh uh, will be uh, adopting such a uh, perspective. What is the situation? Integration is quite fast because there is a big pressure. In each report of FAO and uh, WHO or SET and such uh, organizations, sustainability uh, is emphasized significantly. And uh, as the nutrition and dietetics circles, to what extent we have get adapted to this? There is this fast uh, uh, transformation, but there is still a progress to make. So, while finishing, I would like to say that the, all the microorganisms, animals, plants should be well in health so that human beings can be well in health. We need to attain this objective. We shouldn't be stealing from the future of our grandchildren. Uh, as dietitians, we have a very important role to play in this regard. Thank you very much for your patience. Şimdi kendisinde değindiği gibi hocamızın beslenme konusunda, sürdürülebilir beslenme konusunda toplumun bilinçlenmesi ve politikelerin üretilmesi konusunda büyük görev We have got very important roles to play when it comes to awareness raising. We would like to give a coffee break now and we will be returning in 15 minutes time.
konferansımıza eğitim sistemindeki değişim We are continuing with a speech with regard to changes in the system. Dr. Ellen Field is going to be talking now. The increased climate leadership is the topic of her speech. My name is Ellen Field. I am an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Lakehead University in Orillia. And Orillia is located just north of Toronto, Canada. And here in Orillia, this is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg people. And in Anishinaabeg culture, uh, they often think about seven generations into the future. And for me, this has been something that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of climate change impacts and policy and how we think about educating young people. And in Canada, I would argue that our policies are really only protecting half a generation of people. And we can learn a lot from uh, our traditional landowners here, the Anishinaabe people who considered their policy with seven generations in mind. Um, I would also like to say it's a real pleasure to join this conference. Uh, I first started my professional career as a teacher, and I worked in Istanbul for two years. And so I'm familiar with Turkey and the education system there and some of the very great minds that come out of that school system and out of the country. So thank you for the invitation to speak here as part of this conference. Um, so first, I would just like to highlight that um, I'm sure most people are aware of, about climate change and its impacts um, and climate impacts caused by the increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are leading to higher temperatures, more intense storms and lengthy droughts. And all of these can affect uh, children's health. And so one of the main themes of this conference is around health and nutrition. So that is children's health is more directly impacted by climate change and the research shows that children today will face around three times as many climate disasters as their grandparents did, including wildfires, uh, storms, floods and droughts. Um, this disproportionate burden of climate impacts of young people is shown in this figure from the latest IPCC uh, 2023 ARC synthesis report and you can see for a child born in 2020, which is on that top line, um, as a 40 year old, there is a gradient of color over their body segment. And this corresponds to the amount of warming based on different emission pathways. So you can then compare this to a 40 year old bo body segment with someone who was born in 1980 and the level of climate impacts that they would experience. And that gradient of color correlates with the degrees of warming based on future emission scenarios. So every 0.1 fraction of a degree of warming actually correlates to health impacts, to suffering, and to potentially death. And so we need to start thinking about how um, the burning of fossil fuels is directly related to the suffering, the health, and potential death of future generations. And we need to make that line very clear about these implications. Um, and, and we wanna also focus on the fact that we want to keep our emission scenario pathway as low as possible to keep it in those lighter gradient colors. And so all efforts have big impact when we think about suffering. I also want to speak to um, this very recent research. Actually, I think it came out yesterday um, that was conducted by a global nonprofit called Potential Energy. And it looked at large data sets of communication data from countries around the world and also around what resonates with different populations. And it showed that framing the underlying motivations for climate action, such as jobs or economic growth, or the focus on reducing social inequity, uh, or to protect our health or reduce air or water um, impacts, or even to protect ourselves from extreme 
weather has much less impact in driving climate action than framing it around the protection of future generations. So the author is actually going to say that across every country, love for the next generation was the dominant reason for action on climate change. This is 12 times more popular than job creation. And this is across the political spectrum. So we need to really be focusing on the importance of young people, the importance of every society, um, all sectors of society caring about um, future generations. The next piece before I wanna get into my research, which I will get into, is also focusing on the importance of education in climate policy. And as we're as I'm speaking, uh, COP28 is going on in Dubai. Um, on December 8th, uh, COP28 will be focusing on children, young people, and education. There will be um, governments making um, statements and commitments about increasing climate change education in their school systems. So we're at a bit of a tipping point where we're starting to see um, education systems take climate change education and environmental sustainability seriously. They're starting to move towards mainstreaming this into their uh, national or, or state level curriculum. Um, but I want to highlight this important research um, that identifies that education as a sector is a powerful strategy for re reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So researchers are, have quantified emission reductions from climate change education courses and shown that when there are these courses, 16% of high school students in middle and high income countries can lower their collective carbon footprints by nearly 19 gigatons over 30 over sort of 30 years. So they look at how this results in pro-climate behavior. So this kind of greenhouse gas emission reduction demonstrates that if similar education programs were applied at scale, the potential reduction in carbon emissions would be of similar magnitude to other large scale strategies, such as rooftop solar, uh, electric vehicles, and so it is unfortunate when we see um, policymakers either, you know, of course, denying or or or being slow in their climate policy. And we we do want to see, um, you know, investment in energy infrastructure and many policy interventions. However, education is always this hot potato that's often forgotten, um, and there is a very big ripple effect that happens not just for the students who receive climate change education, but into the communities um, where this type of schooling and educational experience is offered. So uh, a lot of my research has been focused on looking how educational institutions are responding to preparing young people for climate altered futures. And looking at how education provides opportunities to learn about or directly engage in taking action in their local communities. Um, I, I argue that the global child and youth-led climate strike movement is a clear signal of how our formal education institutions have failed to directly address the concerns young people have over their future quality of life. So my research focuses on how the school structure can foster learning that builds relationships across organizations and generations and communities and develop pathways to inclusive and hopeful futures. So children and young people are central agents in my research as they are too often excluded from policy, government, or curriculum decisions that affect their educational experiences and inherited futures. Um, my research also really focuses on teacher practice since their decisions and actions greatly influence child and youth experience in school. So what I'm going to do now is go through some of my recent research studies that act as attempts to create levers that serve to bolster ambition and leadership when it comes to children and young people. And the focus is on ensuring that education systems spend the majority of their time, um, or sorry, that young people have experiences in their education systems where they spend so much time 
learning about what's happening in the world around them instead of only hearing about these things through social media or through the news. So the areas I'll talk to is around um, stakeholder support for improved climate change education, uh, curriculum analysis as a way to look at how our um, state or national level governments are integrating climate change education, how school boards um, and their governance can be influential. Also levels of youth climate anxiety and what that is telling us about education and the role that education can play. And lastly, how do we build collective capacity for those of us who are in teacher education um, to improve uh, the system overall? So the first uh, piece of research I'll just talk about is from my postdoc. And in this, we did a very large study that surveyed over 3,000 Canadians. And this is the focus I want to share here is on looking at stakeholders across the education system to better understand the support for climate change education and action. So in this research study, it was specifically designed to inter or to survey teachers to survey parents, to survey um, young people, so between grades seven and 12, and then also we surveyed members of the general public. And sometimes, um, like this data is very helpful for helping us understand how much interest there is from these different segments of the population, but also it helps to build confidence among policy and decision makers to see that there is widespread support for increased climate change education. So in case you have an administrator who's feeling really uncertain about integrating this into uh, school board policy, this research speaks to how much um, focus there is in society at large and interest. So it showed this research study with over 3,000 Canadians um, surveyed showed that Canadians and educators agree that more should be done to educate young people about climate change. And that was 65% of Canadians on the aggregate and 87% of the educators said we need more. The research also found that in Canada, there's limited class time spent on climate change content. So only a third of educators um, said that they teach climate change content. And I, I don't know what the research says in Turkey, but if any of you are researchers who are in this space, I highly encourage you to be able to get some of these data points to be able to share them and mobilize them to improve climate change education if it needs to be improved. For those teachers who do teach climate change, only one to 10 hours of instruction per year or semester was reported. So I would argue for what is the most significant issue of the 21st century in terms of how it is going to affect all of society, that one to 10 hours of instruction is really insufficient for young people to be receiving in their classroom about what's happening in the world. Um, the other piece we found is that teachers need support. So only about a third, so 32%, of educators feel that they have the knowledge and skills to teach about climate change. And so this is the need for professional development for them so they know how to integrate it into their class. And the last data point I'll speak to you is that students are a key group to target with climate change education and action. And for me, this was the first place. So this study, again, is from 2019. For me, where I saw climate anxiety or the beginnings of climate anxiety in data. So from this, 46% of students of this age 12 to 18 were characterized as aware and that means that they understand that human caused climate change is happening. This is the important part, but they do not believe that human efforts will be effective. So they understand it's happening, but they don't think that um, we can change the course. And so that to me is a burgeoning mental health crisis. Um, next, I'll speak to curriculum. Um, and so uh, myself and three graduate students, we actually sought out to map all of the different provinces in Canada's curriculum to understand where does climate change education exist. 
And in Turkey, since you have a national curriculum, it makes it much easier to assess where does climate change occur in the school system? Are we sure that students are receiving the type of education that they need to know in order to be prepared for climate change when they leave school? This is a big question, and this is why I did this research. In Canada, we have what's called the Federated Education System, and we have 13 different jurisdictions. So we have 10 provinces and 13 ter or three territories. And so we had to collect all of the curricula for all of those places and analyze them. So what I'll show you is, is this and um, some of the concerns that I found in my data, but I think some of the ways that I talk about this may be relevant for you in Turkey. So when we uh, looked at the, the curriculum, we actually just looked for is a keyword there. So do they mention climate change? If yes, we're gonna give it a count. Do they mention climate action? If yes, we're gonna give it a count. Um, and so here are the different jurisdictions. So those are all the provinces of Canada and territories. And you can see where the blue is when it occurs in science classes. And the, social, and the green is in social studies, so things like geography, history, et cetera. And you can see that mostly it occurs in science courses, but it's also really inconsistent. Like the province of Manitoba has a ton of social studies where most other provinces have a lot more in the science. So there really hasn't been a consistent way that it has been integrated into our curriculum. So what we decided as researchers is let's decide what's mandatory versus what's elective because we have a lot of courses in high school, so grade 11, grade 12, where students are deciding um, whether they will take the course. And so when we parse the data between mandatory versus elective, we could start to see um, something very interesting and in that mostly there's only three provinces where more than 50% of the expectations are occurring in their mandatory courses. And those provinces have more recently updated the curriculum. So British Columbia is one, Nova Scotia and the Yukon. But for the rest of the provinces, most of the expectations occur in elective courses at the secondary level. So when I said there were so many in Manitoba in that green, then when we looked at what's mandatory, so many of them fell away because they're all elective courses. So students aren't gonna necessarily take all of those courses. They might take one or they might not, they might not take those. And so we see this all the time that environmental science in particular is an elective course. And if students aren't interested in that, they're not going to take it. So that's why we need a framework that will ensure that, that the, um, provincial or national curricula ensure that climate change education is mandatory and um, has a specific place where we know that students will um, experience it. So then we went on and ranked the curriculum to really look at how, based on what how the curriculum is written, are students going to be experiencing um, or will be taught this? And so level one is really just focusing on the concepts or learning about climate impacts. Number two is a little bit of a higher order thinking. Are they analyzing? Are they interpreting? Are they thinking critically? And level three is does the expectation um, suggest some kind of action? So taking some kind of action. And this was a really sort of blunt analysis. And what we found is really that 40% of the expectations were focused on that level one category. So they're focused on knowledge and understanding of climate change and its impacts. 47% were focused on higher orders of thinking, such as analyzing, interpreting climate impacts. And that's really important. We want young people to be developing those critical thinking skills around climate change. But only 13% of those expectations focused on taking actions to mitigate climate change. So I think these findings give some background context as to why so many young people are frustrated with what they learn on climate change in schools. Uh, because if teachers teach the curriculum as it's currently developed in Canada, then the focus is going to be on learning about climate change science and, it, and the impacts, but not engaging with taking action. It's not going to be either engaging with a very holistic understanding of, you know, how all of society can be addressing climate change. So 
Is it woven into math? Is it woven into business? Is it woven into um, our history classes to think about all of the different ways that society um, is addressing or has previously addressed tough issues. Another one is the civics classes or careers, right? These are important courses for us to be integrating climate change education. But also, if they're not learning about solutions, if they're not learning about ways that they can take action, then they're just learning about all of the impacts and not helping to offset some of that anxiety about feeling unable to do anything about it. And so that is the role that education needs to have, is how do we find openings and pathways to direct students to be responding to communities, climate impacts by taking community-based projects and building the capacities at the community level with their schools and community partners to be improving their, their society. And that is going to be the kinds of capacities that young people need today. And that's going to help offset their anxiety. Um, I just want to highlight that climate change education really should not just be in the cognitive. So much of our curriculum mostly stays in the science on climate change and it stays in the cognitive domain. And uh, research is advocating for it to engage with the socio-emotional. So we're, how do we build resilience through social-emotional capacity? How do we build empathy? Um, for those who are displaced, we're seeing mass global migration happening. Um, how do we also build mindfulness strategies and, and also personal resilience see in the face of the levels of climate anxiety that I'll speak to in a minute that young people are experiencing? Again, this action-oriented piece. So how do we build action capacities and competencies on the individual and also the collective and systemic level to address this issue that the whole world needs to take action on because we are past the point that we can say government can deal with this or this country can deal with this. We need all sectors and we need all adults. Um, as well as focusing on equity. So we need a justice focus central to this because if we only deal with technological fixes on climate, we will recreate inequities. And so we need to center justice in how we approach this as a society so that we aren't perpetuating inequities, which our world has many of now. Um, this, uh, I just wanna focus on um, research we did around uh, creating um, what we can learn from the youth climate justice movement and what education can think about in terms of themes we can learn from the mobilizing of and the messaging of the youth climate justice movement. And sorry, my slide is not clear there. So the first one is having a justice and equity orientation. If you see the climate strike movement, it has that orientation. It centers justice and equity. It centers young people in terms of the disproportionate burden, but also in terms of other racialized minorities or countries that have done the least to create the problem, but are feeling the burden and having the, the disproportionate impacts. But I really want to thought highlight here leadership and fostering student efficacy. So <clears throat> this point in particular is one that's worth researching more in depth, but from the groups that I have worked with here in Canada, the youth groups who are doing the most, I have seen that they come from programs and schools that focus on building leadership capacity they don't come from a biology class that teaches about ecology or an environmental science class that teaches about climate change. The groups that I have seen in Canada that are doing the most climate action work are coming out of leadership programs. And so if we really want to think about how do we ensure students receive really strong climate change education, we need to think about how we build leadership capacity among young people and how we foster that sense of efficacy and ability to be leaders. Um, I'll leave the rest. I also want to just highlight that a fairly recent study that came out this year 
shows that social media has become the primary source of sustainability education for Gen Z and Gen Alpha, despite being the least trusted source. And so this, again, speaks to the importance of education, because if young people are receiving most of their information about sustainability in social media spaces, where there is lots of vested interest to sway their beliefs through mis, mal, and disinformation campaigns, we need schools to help them debunk some of the information that they receive on social media. And social media also has some great information about climate change, but we need to help them be able to sift through that to be able to decode that. And so they aren't following mis and mal information um, campaigns um, and becoming deniers or... Um, so this is a really important piece for why we need strong climate change education in schools. Uh, I will now speak to some research we've been doing over the last several years with um, teachers to better understand and as well as policy to really understand how we can help move the needle in Canada. Um, so some of the papers we have come forward is really looking at like what teachers are doing um, rather than looking at all the deficits and researching with teachers who are already engaging and, and doing this kind of work. And we know that in general, there's the curriculum um, but teachers also make professional decisions about how they're going to teach, how they're going to engage their class. They also read their students in terms of deciding, like, are my students have been having a really tough time. Maybe I'm going to focus more on hope right now than talking about the urgency of climate, right? So they make these decisions all the time because it is a responsive profession. So one of the things that we found that was really interesting is that in this policy vacuum where we see there's real gaps in curriculum, we are still seeing teachers teach climate change education in all kinds of courses where there are no expectations for it. So you can see um, red is dance. So we're having teachers who are teaching climate change education through dance. There, are, I can tell you right now, I've looked at all of the curriculum across Canada. There are no expectations in the dance. Um, uh, curriculum. Uh, we are also seeing them teach it in health where there are not explicit curriculum expectations around climate change and climate impacts and health are massive. There need to be, but there are not. Um, in addition, um, math, there are not climate change expectations in math and we're seeing that's the yellow teachers teach it there. So this is all to say that actually with a little bit of professional development, we don't have to wait for curricular reform. We can help teachers be ready to integrate this into their courses if they're not feeling confident to do it. The long-term goal should be curricular reform, um, but the short-term can be professional development for teachers uh, can move the needle quite a lot. Next, I'm gonna talk to some research around um, school board governance. So in Canada, we have um, 380 school boards that make a lot of decisions around the health and safety of young people. Um, and so they have uh, families of schools that are within a school board. And what we did is we collected, uh, we actually built a web scraper that went out and collected um, any publicly available information on any of the school board websites. And pulled it that was related to climate change or climate action. And so we received 1800 files and then we reviewed those. And then we manually also went to each website and put in those search terms for each school board and pulled all of those files. So we reviewed whether the school board has a climate action plan, whether it has a commitment to uh, a greenhouse gas reduction in their strategic plan or in their environmental sustainability plan. Not all school boards have environmental sustainability plans. We also found that some regions have what's called mandatory accountability reports that those provinces require those school boards to um, talk about how much energy they've used for heating and cooling their schools. And then we looked at how many school boards have declared um, a climate emergency. Now, the school board level is sort of in line with, we have a like municipal government and in Canada, we have um, 452 uh, municipalities and many of them have 
um, or I should say about half of them, have some kind of climate policy. So they're planning around climate change. However, from our research, when we look at how many school boards we have, and we've looked at how many of them have climate policies, we are not anywhere close to half. We're at about 1% of our school boards have these policy documents. So what we found is four school boards out of 380 have climate action plans. Um, 10 have declared climate emergencies and 14 have committed to greenhouse gas emissions in strategic plans or in sustainability plans. And those who, have, who are on this um, leaderboard, they're leaders. They are doing this because they are not being asked to do it by government. There's no requirement to do this. And that would be great as if the provincial ministry said you need to do this. Um, they're doing it because they see the need in their community. We need to change that. We need our educational institutions to be leading on this issue. Young people know that climate change is happening and they need to see their schools taking action and being responsive and planning for their futures. So that brings me to uh, the last piece of research that uh, I wanna speak to, which is around um, a study that we released last January where we benchmarked climate anxiety for young people in Canada. And I worked with Dr. Lindsay Galway, who is a Canada Research Chair in Socioecological Health. And what we found is that um, we surveyed a thousand people and of youth and the youth are a little bit older than your like younger students in school. So these are actually 16 to 25 year olds. And we surveyed them around their climate emotions and we followed a, a landmark study that was released the year previously by some researchers out of the UK. So we used their survey tool, but we also added a whole bunch of questions to ask young people also around what they thought they needed or ways that the education system could be responsive. So what we found is most likely not surprising if you follow this space. So big picture, I'd say, you know, if you need a hashtag, the kids are not all right. Um, young people are experiencing a constellation of challenging climate emotions at high levels, including being afraid at 66 percent, sad at 65, anxious, helpless, powerless and angry. And these all range between 66 to 54 percent of the youth segment experiencing in these emotions. So this is a sort of constellation of um, challenging climate emotions, which is how climate anxiety seems to be emerging in the research literature. Um, and this is an infographic that summarizes our findings. And so I'll just read a few of the stats. So 80% of the participants report that climate change impacts on their overall mental health. 40% of participants report at least moderate impacts on their daily life, like things like eating, sleeping, uh, schoolwork. Uh, the survey data also illustrate that climate change is contributing in myriad ways to negative thoughts about their future. For example, 48% believe that humanity is doomed. Um, 76 report that people have failed to take care of the planet and 39% report hesitation about having children due to climate change. So our data illustrate that an action at the systemic and structural level shaped the lived experience of climate emotions and climate anxiety among young Canadians. So notably, 64% of survey respondents do not think that the Canadian government is doing enough to avoid climate catastrophe. So when we have leaders not taking action or not not taking enough action because the Canadian government is taking action but according to our youth segment they're not doing enough to avoid climate catastrophe this correlates to a sense of betrayal and this sense of betrayal is what compounds climate anxiety we could ask this same question to schools we could say is your in relation to climate change i believe that my school is Da, da, da, da, da, da, da, doing enough to avoid a climate catastrophe. Be curious to see what his students have to say, right? Are our schools places that they feel are doing enough? The other piece here, which I think is really important when we're thinking about health, 
is that 25% of our young people identified seeking emotional mental health supports from others as an important support to help cope with climate emotions. However, one third of the participants reported they do not talk about climate change with other people, while another third reported that when they do try, they feel ignored or dismissed. So this is a real question we need to figure out is how to get young, how to create spaces where young people feel safe about talking about these things rather than feeling experiencing that that kind of betrayal and isolation and just sitting in those complex emotions rather than talking about it then hopefully finding a way to see that they can do things that are constructive um, so they don't become disenfranchised or isolated um, and and hopefully once they get connected and feeling like there's things they can do in their community that they can get involved to do these things and that helps not just our their own mental health that helps climate action so as much as climate impacts are you know we can look at the very direct physical health impacts we need to think about the mental health component of this because the mental health component in many ways is a stumbling block for uh society-wide action but I would say we need to be cautious because many young people have also indicated they don't feel safe about talking about this with their teachers in their class. They don't want to necessarily be vulnerable in class um, with either their peers or their teachers. So we need to do more research on what are those safe spaces for young people. But the most important piece I want to show here is while there is this overwhelming climate anxiety that the youth population is sharing, most youth still believe that we can do something about it if we work together and half believe that they can contribute. So how do we find those spaces? In Canada here, we have a program called the Youth Climate Corps, which um, is, does not exist, but there is a lot of mobilizing happening, saying we want the federal government to create this program for young people so that when they graduate high school, they could go work in like job training. But the jobs are all going to be like climate um, career kind of job trainings. I know the U.S. has just created some kind of training pathway. Um, and when it comes to what they said about what the formal education system can do more, it's funny because we specifically said about social emotional dimensions and the top three things that young people said have nothing to do with social emotional dimensions. They were like, actually just talk about it. So increase the climate change content in schools. Second, teach solutions. And the third is teach climate risk and urgency. The other supports that they suggested around social emotional is like providing mental health supports, um, like counseling services or like student peer groups so that they can talk to um, each other about it, as well as with instructors engage in reassurance, um, positive and hopeful messaging. Now, I would also like to argue before we start at, um, sort of our, our schools are grossly underfunded um, here in Canada and mental health support funding in schools has been diminished over the last 10 years. However, before we start just throwing tons of money at mental health supports, I agree with um, Elizabeth Pinsky, this quote on the slide that um, says, or she says, I believe the fundamental and best treatment for youth climate distress is a rapid and just transition from fossil fuels. I genuinely consider all that work to be in the area of mitigating climate anxiety. So as we look for solutions to address climate anxiety, we can't only focus on symptoms. Like we can't only provide better mental health supports. We need to look at the root cause and we need to address that. Um, so there are some strategies for navigating climate emotions with young people, and I just want to quickly highlight them. So don't assume or pathologize if someone's saying they're struggling. Be patient and listen. Normalize and validate their experience. Don't just try to fix a problem. Don't just, many teachers do this. Teachers do this all the time. We're going to just fix it. Let's get moving. Let's get active. Or don't only focus on positive emotions. Ask a young person how they want to be supported. Be a listening ear. Um, if they want to hear some solutions, you can provide them, but only if they say yes. Don't provide false optimism and don't say don't worry. We should all be worried. And to say don't worry is to create cognitive dissonance for young people. Be honest. 
Young people need us to be honest to them, to be truthful about the uncertainty and the risk that we are facing. But what we can then talk about, which is not false optimism, is that there are many evidence-based solutions that if we just implement them, we don't need future technologies. There are numerous co-benefits and we can deal with it, but we need we need that implementation. Lastly, I'll just highlight, um, I met some of my colleagues who are um, also presenting as keynotes. Uh, we've been working over the since July and it will be released this May on uh, a global greening curriculum guidance, which will highlight, um, or not highlight, which creates a learning framework for biodiversity, climate science, climate justice, resilience, post-carbon economy, and sustainable lifestyles for all UNESCO um, partners. So currently, actually on Friday, I believe 70 countries from around the world are committing to integrating mandatory climate change education. Uh, this policy framework will help guide those countries as to how to do this, referencing uh, best evidence. And lastly, the, the last thing I want to share with you in case anyone here is from teacher education is one of the um, projects that we're currently working on is to work with other faculties of education to improve climate change education across our education landscape. And so we're doing numerous things. We've just had a national roundtable. We're developing a national e-course for all teacher candidates. Um, we have some professional learning webinars that we're running for both teachers who are in the K-12 system, as well as those who are teacher educators in faculties of education. Um, and then there is funding that we are adjudicating and sending to faculties to improve their climate change education. And this is all supported by the government of Canada. So I'm just putting this out there as a, um, if anyone is wanting to learn about this work that we're doing in Canada, please reach out. I'm happy to share about everything we have learned. And with that, that is my talk. I hope I've given you some things to think about in terms of how our education systems can not only teach young people about the content that they need to know about climate change, but also provide some of the um, mental health supports, the social emotional supports that young people need in the world today. Because we all just went through COVID and now we are going through the slow motion emergency of, of climate impacts and we are in a crisis and we need to take this seriously and we need our educational institutions to be leading for young people to safeguard their futures to the best that they can. Thank you. Dr. Ellen Field, thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Ellen Field. Now we are going to talk about an issue which is related with nutrition. And this presentation will be answering many questions. From Actons University Faculty of Literature, Dr. Ejavarlika, so you are invited to the floor. Hello. First of all, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for waiting until this time with patience. I will try to summarize my presentation and I will try to raise awareness. I'm from Actins University Psychology Department. I'm a staff member in clinical psychology and I'm also the head of the Center for Psychological Researches. I'm also involved in psychotherapy. Today, talk about an issue which it seems like it is outside the topic, but which should be mentioned, which should be emphasized. Children's mental health for a sustainable future. First of all, I would like to thank the head of the foundation and everybody who has organized this uh, conference mainly, Mrs. Hunkyarj. I'm very proud to be here because 
This is the university in which I had my postgraduate studies. As I'm working in clinical psychology, I'm working with adults and children, and I'm involved in some practices as a psychotherapist. I will talk about uh, my clinical observations, and I will also share some statistical reported information. I will look into sustainability from the perspective of mental health. I will focus on well-being, uh, statistics, psychological problems among children and adolescents, and risk factors and preventive factors. I would like to introduce a new concept to you. I'm working in this area directly, but it is also related with this topic and the previous topic. Neurobiology between people and stress and management. We say children, but we cannot think of children without families, parents, and teachers. So I will talk about some stress management skills for us as well. Within the framework of context of sustainability, one we say children's mental health. We can say that children are uh, our future. If we are talking about sustainable policies, being healthy is the basic concept. We want to have generations which can adapt and which has a high awareness. There should be less psychological disorders. There should be more mental health literacy. We want a, f a future and societies which can take healthier decisions. When we think about all of these, the mental health of children and adolescents becomes the heart of all these issues. So what does health mean? It is a full um, sense of well-being, physically, psychologically, socially. What is psychological health? There should not be any psychological problems, and it is a psychological well-being. What is psychological well-being? When we are faced with challenges, the person should be able to realize himself or herself. As a result of some researches, there are some characteristics related with psychological well-being. Enthusiasm for life, gratitude, love, and feeling of hope. Some of us cannot feel it because of some reasons, and it is related with these factors. This is an education conference. Uh, being successful is important, but in order to be able to adapt, we need these skills. So we should emphasize these issues. Reef has a psychological well-being model. First, you have to have self-acceptance positively and negatively, and about your positive characteristics and negative characteristics, and also having positive relations with the others, of autonomy, having a life purpose, having a certain level of control on the environment, and being engaged in activities that will support one's personal development. I will continue by some negative news, and then I will give you some good news. When I was preparing this presentation, of course, I looked at the statistics. What is the society doing? What are the results? It looks like a very complicated table, but let me summarize it. WHO says that at least 10% of the children and adolescents have some kind of mental disease. If measures are not taken, one-fourth of uh, people will have a mental or neurological disorder. I want to open a parenthesis here. Not all the negative feelings are diseases. In order for some situation to be, or in order for some condition to be a disease, functionality must be dis uh, destroyed. It should cause problems in the person, certain um, competences of the person should be lost and the person should be involved in out-of-norm behaviors in the society. But the first question should be asked is, does this situation affect you? Does it affect your eating and drinking, sleeping, daily activities? So, 
This is related with the food as well, as you see. When we have a problem, first our nutrition and sleep are affected. Currently, obesity is defined. There are also eating disorders. And these are due to em emotional uh, eating or not eating, you know, penalizing yourself. This is a pathology as well. Among girls between the age of 11 to 15, uh, the second and in the same age group, um, third is suicide. It ranks second among the reasons for death. So, WHO explains the suicide as one of the highest reasons for death. Unfortunately, drug abuse has increased. It also causes a huge hospital burden. In the last 10 years, one person out of 11 people who has experienced a conflict or a war in their countries will have a medium level or a grave level of mental disorder. Depression and anxiety has increased a lot. Post-traumatic stress disorder has increased, especially after the earthquake. We can see that uh, because a long time has passed and uh, we can diagnose people with this. Psychiatry is also um, dealing with bipolar disorder, um, manic depressive people and schizophrenia. Around the world, 350 million people are in depression. This is a 2019 um, forecast, but there has been a 28% increase in the last two years. So we're talking about huge numbers. 970 million people have either mental health or drug abuse. I did not see it as a number in the reports, but eating disorder has also a connection with digital dependencies because I'm hoping that sorry I'm guessing that we will see this in the upcoming reports WHO says that in more than 40 percent of the countries there is no mental health policy in more than 30 percent of them there is no mental health program in more than 25 percent there is no mental health legislation in Turkey we are um, currently working on a mental health legislation, but this should be improved throughout the world. Because nutrition and psychological health should be involved in health. It's, it's a holistic, it should be a holistic approach. When we look at the children in 2022, Turkstat has carried out a child research there are some, you know, promising answers as well. The children, most of the children spend more time with their families. Their families have better communication with them. But in the 4 to 70, 17, 4 to 17 age group, 14% walk or run. And the research included 14,705 children. The, the first finding is weird. I mean, children should walk and run. In the same age group, actually in the age group of 5 to 17, the rate of children having difficulties in concentrating is 1.4%. Concentration problems are expected to be more, actually, because attention deficit and hyperactivity have been diagnosed a lot. In the age group 6 to 17, 13% of the children feel the pressure of school uh, lessons. 13.8% of the children in the age group 6 to 17 is bullied. And 6.8% uh, of the children in the 13 to 17 age group feel ostracized, excluded, and 50% of the age group of 13 to 17 50% uh, feel anxious. The Higher Education Board has carried out a uh, workshop with universities and other institutions. I have reached a report of this workshop. What are the common problems? These are the problems of the youth. 
Maybe there are university students among us. Maybe maybe they have similar problems, anxiety, depression, drug and al- drug abuse, and alcoholic uh, beverages use, relationship dependencies, cyber bullying, psychological violence, um, harassment. I mean, being engaged in harassment and being subject to harassment, and uh, tendency to suicide, digital dependencies, adaptation problems, anxiety for the future, bullying, feeling alone, lack of communication, um, social pressure. These are diagnosed, um, and among the complaints that are uh, included in the application, we see future anxiety, bullying, lack of communication, lack of trust, um, lack of feeling any meaningful life or social pressure. I should also focus this second uh, part as well. The well-being of children, what is it based on? If the factors that develop the children are more than the factors that hamper the development of the child, then we can say that the children are in a better well-being situation. The capacity of the children to manage stress, developing autonomy and uh, confidence, development of self-system, self-respect and self-identity. And the children should have some skills, competency and resilience to overcome developmental problems. So problematic factors must be less, preventive factors must be high. And resilience is the most important intervention that we should focus on. Now I will go into details. So resilience is very important. Sometimes it is used with other terms. When we say resilience, I, it also it is also understood as if it is about enduring, about and it's about enduring, endurance, perseverance. To what extent do the children feel that they can overcome challenges? So, demonstrating a better development and mental health despite the challenges. How can we assess ourselves in terms of resilience? If I'm talking about psychological resilience, there has to be a risk. There has to be a negative experience, a traumatic experience, a stress, a cause of stress, and a crisis. And secondly, the person should show a development better than accepted despite these challenges. This is what we call resilience. We are experiencing crisis all the time. We had a pandemic, earthquake, wars. So we meet the first factor. How about the second one? We are experiencing these problems. How can I overcome these problems? How can I be aware of it? When we are working with children and adolescents, I should say that this the adult can manage himself or herself because the brain is mature and this is related with the prefrontal cortex and its development. So I can manage myself, I can understand my emotions, I can take um, sensible decisions. But the child has not completed the development the same thing goes for the brain of the adolescents. It's more chaotic among adolescents because the hormones are also in mold. When this is the case, the capacity of a child to manage will not be um, done by the child. So we need, uh, sorry, the children need healthy parents and other adults like teachers, school society to support them. If you are working with children, if you are working on resilience, we should um, 
involve all the systems like cultural structure, school education services, health services, peer, family, and society. Regarding psychological resilience, what are risks and what are the pre preventive factors? There are psychopathologies and uh, certain diseases have increased a lot, but there are still things that can be done. I would like to attract your attention to that. Let me look at the risk factors. If the family of a child is poor, if they have a low socioeconomic level, if there's a psychopathological problem among the parents, if there is divorce, death of parents, uh, natural disasters, uh, domestic violence, or sexual harassment, the child will be more sensitive. I'm excluding gen genetic disorders, but epigenetic studies say that environmental factors can change them, so we are not desperate. I can develop some policies to decrease risk factors, and I can increase preventive factors. There are many studies about preventive factors. I'm presenting you the summary of the activities. The activities say that these preventive factors can be individual factors. Secondly, there can be preventive factors about the family of the children. And thirdly, there can be some preventive factors outside the family. So individually, does the child feel self-confident? Confident? Uh, in some researches show that a sense of humor also inclu is included here having a high intellectual capacity. The preventive factors about the families being advantages socioeconomically, having close relationships with parents, and the parents having good parenting features. I'd like to emphasize this because we will uh, benefit from this. We have to have good relations with our children. Let me look at the family factors. How does the child interact with the Adults outside the family. If the child is going to a good school, if the child is in a good social environment, this also helps. And we look at the issue from this perspective. There are many things that we can do. As I've told you, I will talk about neurobiology between individuals. Siegel defined this in 2012, and this issue is being studied a lot. You can understand from its meaning, from its name, sorry. This is an important factor in the development of brains. Um, what is this? This is relations. One brain can develop only in the presence of another brain, by interacting, by having relations. It is important to know this. There are many child development books about this. So these um, studies and books uh, include the practice of this topic. When you are interacting with children from right brain to right brain, talk about emotions, then left brain. What is left brain? Brain, it is being rational. If the child falls down, I mean, we, sh we should go there and we should tell the person that, yo, you must hurt, you must be hurting. But then maybe you can say, maybe if you didn't run, you would not fall down. So once we get to know the brain, these things became appropriate strategies. It is very important to implement things that we learn. That is why I wanted to introduce these concepts to you. Here, you, you see the brain. Of course, the professors, the students know this very well, but I'd like to say that. With the approach of neurobiology between the individual, the front part of the brain is emphasized. This prefrontal cortex is developed the last, because first, Amygdala, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, uh, it is developed. 
So how does this develop? First, the limbic system and amygdala feels safe and then prefrontal cortex develops. In order for amygdala and the limbic system to feel safe, there has to be a safe connection between the child and the parent. Because baby thinks that uh, it is a part of the mother. If the baby is loved and uh, interacted, then the child will have a positive self-identity uh, um, sense. So there has to be a secure attachment. If there is no such good interaction, then the child will feel that it is uh, he or she is sufficient, insufficient. As it was mentioned in the climate change presentation, if you ensure this trust, anxiety will lower. If you can keep anxiety at a normal level, you can take healthy decisions. Otherwise, there will be disorders. So, requirement for trust and a secure attachment concepts are very important. In the post-earthquake studies, there were some studies about, you know, feeling safe and secure attachment. In the psychological first aid studies, uh, say something. The people affected by earthquake should be taken to therapy immediately. We should give them medicine. Actually, what needs to be done was that you are accessible, you are there, and you can support them whenever they need. This is psychological first aid. Listen, watch, follow up, and form a bond. This is the biggest gift. What does this mean? And the child is having a problem. The child needs accessible parents. But these parents must not be critical. These parents should not interfere. The parents should have a motivation about helping. So being heard, being seen, and being accessible are very important concepts. In this context, I will talk about the concept of accompanying the child. Actually, the parents are accompanying the children. If there's a problem, the parents should be like, how can we solve it together? The parents should not be blaming the child. So this shows us the interaction and communication. In all the processes, maybe you have noticed that social support is very important. We have carried out some studies about the symptoms of the people affected by the earthquake. Who has coped better? We have seen that those who have a stronger social support network um, had an easier time because there are some other people trying to help the individual. So the same thing goes for the children. Balance, resilience, insight and empathy should be developed. It is more important than mathematics or science skills because these concepts affect the skill of adaptation and intelligence is defined as better adaption to changes. I think in the curricula, we should have these concepts in a more emphasized manner. In relation to neurobiology between individuals, I would like to talk about stress as well. There is a model which is called biopsychosocial model. When we talk to a person, we try to make a whole assessment in a holistic manner. We look at the health and disease condition, and this is a model that assesses the people biologically, psychologically, and sociologically. There is a biological infrastructure or framework, there is a psychological framework and sociological framework. Who were affected the most in the earthquake region? Those who had biological sensitivities and the people who had some psychological uh, conditions were affected more. We call earthquake a stressor, a, a cause of stress. 
So, a stress just triggers some of the sensitivities that we have. In terms of a sustainable mental health, I should focus on the way I'm managing stress. When we look at the definition of stress, we can say that it's, a, it's an imbalance that, is, that emerges when the organism is uh, endangered and threatened. We have to have stress so that the, the individual should take action. I mean, we need stress. If there is a fire, my biological mechanism says that I should escape. There is no problem about instantaneous stress. But when these problems become chronic, then it becomes a problem. I will look at the factors of the stress. Lack of having a job, unemployment, poverty, repeated bullying, repeated harassment. These are the main stressors that are chronic. So parents should be accessible to prevent this. A study was carried out. It demonstrates that stress is different for each person. Not the incident itself. The perception in the mind of the person is the real cause of stress. The perceived stress makes the person ill. Because there is an imbalance, the person says, my resources are not sufficient to manage it. Then the bell rings. Resilience becomes effective here. Do I have resources? Do I have a social support network? Are there people who will help me? Can I overcome this psychologically? So, maybe among there are people who think like, let's do not have stress in examinations. That's not possible. There should be a certain amount of stress. Because stress is a physical reaction. Under stress, there is anxiety. Stress is the physical symptom. So I can change my approach towards stress. Can I look at stress as an energy that mobilizes and triggers me physically and mentally? How can I channel this into something else? And why am I feeling it? What should I do to eliminate this? This is my summary. When you are working with stress, we are working on the mind. What are our cognitive errors, problem-solving skills, our relation with fine arts? So we're trying to raise awareness here about the, the mind, but a body is a whole, health is a whole, mind is a whole. We are feeling the stress in our body, so I have to work on the body as well. Then I should have regular nutrition, regular exercise. In parentheses, I said via neurobiology among people. I mean, walking with somebody. I mean, going to a sports hall and performing, walking, running alone is something else, but walking with somebody is different. Sleep order, self-care skills, relaxing techniques, and personal stress profile and awareness raising is important. So sim sympathetic and parasympathetic functions must be balanced. So, can I work on the mind and the body together? I will in, engage in mindfulness system, and I will focus on my physical activity as well. I'm sure you heard of it. Mindfulness is a very popular term. Are we really mindful of it? So we can say that it is a wise 
um, awareness. So in mindfulness, what do we do? The individual will not focus and try to change the physical and psychological impact of stress, but will notice the situation. So in order for us to be able to do it with children, first we should be able to do it ourselves. So you should also uh, try to realize this. I don't. Lastly, I have some recommendations. This is a really vast subject. There are many topics in child mental health, but I'd like to focus on what we can do. What are the main actors? Parents, caregivers, families, peers, teachers in school. Can we focus on educational values, love for human beings, feeling of friendship, solidarity, helping each other, valuing people? I see that in the curricula, these issues are not given importance unless you prefer it. The counseling and guidance services are not focusing on these intensively. Usually schools are focusing on cognitive skills and academic success. People are asking, what is your score? But nobody asks, what did you learn? Did you like it? Did you help somebody? We don't ask these things to children. So we should focus on the social problem. With regard to stress management and resilience, we should have certain classes in the curricula. When we assess the previous presentations, we can say that if we can include sustainability and anxiety about climate change in schools, that will be good, but we should also incorporate it with counseling and guidance services. People need to feel safe if the people, especially the youth and children, feel like mm, there is a climate change problem, they are anxious, if they feel that they have a bad future, those primitive brain mechanisms will function. We have to be very careful in such a way to keep anxiety at a certain level. Okay, there is a climate change crisis, but what can we do about it? We should emphasize on what we can do in a constructive manner. Families and teachers will be very important as role models. Each information provided by the teachers is important. Sometimes you learn something, but you don't learn it in your heart. It's about getting it from a role model. If the teacher has internalized something by heart and by brain, the student will do the same. So I would like to emphasize the necessity and importance of being a role model. Moreover, policies should also be identified. We have to have sustainable policies about mental health. There is a big risk here as well. If we don't have healthy brains to manage climate change, then we cannot do anything. Education, education, education, I would like to emphasize it. And lastly, I would like to talk about a book, which makes me feel very, very good. Child, mole, fox, and horse. So the child loses her way and uh, the animals are helping the child. The child says, isn't it weird? We see everything outside, but everything is happening inside us. So the mole asks, what was your best discovery? The child says, the fact that I'm sufficient as I, I, I am. The horse says, asking for help does not mean surrendering. And lastly, Everybody is scared a little bit, but when we are together, we are less scared. So this is the example of neurobiology between people, between individuals. Thank you very much.
Dr. Ecevarlık Özsoy'a değerli... We would like to thank Dr. Ecevarlık Özsoy for her presentation as she has mentioned for a sustainable world. Nutrition is not sufficient. We have to protect mental well-being. We cannot accomplish this by only one individual or in the institution. We can do it all together. Now, from Arizona University, Applied Computer Department, Training Technology Department, Professor Dr. Betu Schwartzki will talk about education and technology trends in a sustainable future. The presentation uh, I have today is uh, titled Education and Technology Trends for Sustainable Future. Uh, I will start by describing a little bit what sustainability means in the context of education, um, and then I will move on to two trends. One is in education and the other one is in the technological uh, side of things. And then I will close uh, with uh, final uh, takeaways from this uh, presentation. Um, According to the U.S. Partnership for Education uh, for Sustainable Development, they came up with this, um, you know, pretty long um, description of what sustainability uh, means. Um, if you notice, uh, it's called sustainable development. So it uh, refers to the process of um, keeping this ongoing and uh, working on uh, creating solutions to um, the current problems with sustainability. It is defined as a combination of content, learning methods, outcomes that help students develop their knowledge base. So the first students need to understand um, what sustainability means and what kind of knowledge they need to uh, develop uh, about the environment, uh, economy and society. And they also need to develop skills, perspective and values. So it's not about um, uh, only about uh, knowledge. Uh, that guides them and motivates them to seek sustainable um, uh, living and uh, they also participate in a, a, a democratic society and living in a sustainable manner. I know it's a very long uh, title, but um, I believe it really captures uh, what it means uh, sustainability in education. If we have to shorten this a little bit um, and sort of I understand that as a, as a long definition and description, uh, we can say that in education, sustainability refers to finding solutions for our multidimensional world. Um, this, is a, this is a good one because it sort of highlights the main um, themes when it comes to sustainability in education. First of all, sustainability is um, usually when we say sustainability, uh, we we um, think about environment, and but it's not only environment. You can see that environment is just one component of it, and there are also some social um, impact as well as economic impact. And sustainability is an uh, interaction of these um, three uh, fields or disciplines uh, together. So it's multidisciplinary. Just uh, creating solutions or thinking about environment is not going to solve any problem. Um, it is complex because it involves um, too many different fields to work together in a multidisciplinary format. And that type of collaboration always brings some challenges with it. Uh, it requires a problem solving approach um, because um, in US they call this grand challenges um, and sustainability is one of them. Um, so problem solving approach is also very complex. And finally, it's not exactly in the definitions, but I edit this one, it's place-based, it's local. So when we think about sustainability, sure, we can you know, go ahead and create solutions uh, that's gonna affect, impact the entire uh, world, but sustainability starts from the local environment. So when we think about education, students have to start from where they live. Uh, their soil, their weather, their industries uh, that change their environment and um, what kind of solutions they can uh, offer because it may be very different. Let's say you are living in Ankara, it may be very different than much more industrialized Istanbul and or that region. If you are living in a small uh, you know, city, 
um, which has more agricultural development going on, then you have different kind of environments. So while looking at the sustainability from a global perspective, it's, it's uh, obviously needed. Um, in its very core, sustainability is also place-based and local. Um, so at this point, I want to talk about, because, you know, our topic is uh, education, uh, I would like to bring uh, your attention uh, what we call human development index. So in this index, um, United Nations started this index uh, to define um, the quality, to describe the quality of living in different nations around the world. And then they defined four areas, infant mortality, Longevity, so, you know, um, at the beginning of life, what is the chance of your living? And at the end of your life, what is the chance of you living longer uh, and healthier life? And as a whole society, what is the population growth rate? This is a major problem in almost all over the country, all over the world, with the exception of Africa. And then finally, literacy or illiteracy, and this is where the education comes into uh, picture. If you want to look at this from the visual perspective, uh, and United Nations updated this Human Development Index, um, there are three components of it. One is, uh, again, it's the physical health, uh, your life expect expectancy at the beginning of birth, and then life expect expectancy at the end of the life. So that is uh, one of the um, metrics we use to understand the quality of people and quality of living uh, within nations. The second one is where education comes into picture. And this is expected years of schooling and how many, you know, um, years of school kids attend and then the quality of it. And then finally, it ends up in economy. Um, uh, so how much uh, each uh, people and each families are making to understand um, their, um, you know, standard of living. So this part is economy, the second part is uh, education, and the first part is health and society. We have to think of the human development index as a whole to understand where we can sort of um, place sustainability related issues. Now, if you're wondering where Turkey <laughs> uh, gets into this picture, where it is, um, actually the picture is not that dark. Um, Turkey is one of the top in the world. Remember, the um, world has many, many countries, more than 200 uh, countries, um, at the very lower end of European index, but on the top of most Asian, African, and South American countries. So um, the situation in Turkey doesn't look very dark. Um, so now I'll move to the, uh, the main topics in my presentation. Um, what are some of the education trends uh, that we are uh, looking when we talk about sustainability? One is that um, uh, the learning objectives are changing. What students need to be learning and how they need to be learning uh, is changing. For instance, I mentioned about multidisciplinary uh, approach to sustainability. So that means that learning objectives need to reflect that. Uh, the second thing is the context of learning and colleges where students are learning. This is where the place-based learning is uh, given into picture. How students are learning, how teachers are teaching, um, educational structures and policies. Um, these are all, um, you know, these are maybe not, does not sound new, but each, each of these areas require a different approach to look at. And finally, inclusive, inclusivity and diversity. And this is a huge, huge trend. Every university, even um, the schools are not, uh, now having diversity um, officers. Um, why diversity? Because when you look at the human, um, you know, living expectancy or uh, the quality of life, um, most of the countries on the top of that list are democratic countries where they value diversity. What does diversity do? Um, if everyone thinks and speaks in the same way, there's no development, right? There's no novelty, there's no new approaches coming in because everyone has a similar mindset. Um, but when there's a diversity of uh, diversity of opinions and arguments, you know, of a uh, hopefully peaceful manner, then there is novelty and uh, innovations coming with it. 
Um, I also wanted to include some of the environmental trends, um, the climate change and what climate change uh, is bringing to educational environment. It's, it's becoming really important. And um, when I mentioned about what students need to be learning, um, this is one of the topics. Students need to be learning about climate change and what impact it has and what can be done. And, and when you um, try to solve climate-related problems, how does that impact uh, society? How does it impact economy? Because you don't want to solve climate problems um, by damaging your economy, or you don't want to grow industries that will damage your uh, climate. So there needs to be a balance between these um, uh, different systems. Um, sustainability and environmental issues have to be part of the curriculum and the organizational structure. By organizational structures, what I mean is that um, it's again, it's a big trend um, to create neighborhoods and schools uh, that use green policies uh, and not um, create too much garbage, too much, uh, uh, you know, um, damaging products uh, to the environment and using the materials uh, that are environmental friendly and organizations, universities, schools are integrating these um, civil engineering ideas, I have to say, and construction and engineering ideas into the their structures. And uh, even in simple purchases like buying paper, pencils, and they pay spe special attention to buy environmentally friendly uh, and disposable um, a products and, and use of less plastics and, and those damaging materials. The good news is that technology uh, also presents some solutions uh, to the environment uh, issues. When we talk about the technology um, related trends, uh, I mostly use the Horizon's uh, latest report. This is a report that's been published every year um, to identify uh, some of the trends in, you know, dominant in the education world. Uh, the first one is, uh, it's no surprise to anyone, is a generative AI. Um, this is um, really impacting um, learning objectives, learning assessments, um, entire board of education. Uh, I mean, I can uh, devote a whole presentation to this topic. Um, in the US, uh, we are discussing this uh, all the time. The problem with generative AI is unfortunately the technology is ahead of the policies and regulations and that the uh, countries have. So the technology is moving uh, further and then we try to catch up with creating uh, policies to understand um, the solution. Um, with the emerging technologies, this has always been the issue, but with generative AI, I think the rush to build a structure um, is really uh, urgent and critical. The other uh, new trend in the world of technology is the teaching and learning modalities. Um, after the pandemic, we started discussing HyFlex model, uh, mostly for undergraduate students. Uh, what this is is that um, you offer a face-to-face -face traditional um, instruction, but students have option to take the same class. Um, either using online platforms, attending at different, you know, different times uh, based on their schedules. And um, what this means is that um, students have more options uh, to choose from and universities are experimenting with different high flex models to um, meet the student needs. The next trend is micro credentials. Uh, this is sometimes you will see this in the literature as a stackable degrees. What I mean by that is that in the old days, students will go and get a you know master's degree or undergraduate degree. But nowadays, universities we offer undergraduate certificates, graduate certificates, um, specialize or focus on a very sort of detail, very sort of sub, sub, sub subject. Um, and so students collect those different degrees, taking two or three courses uh, for a certificate A, 
uh, getting another certificate uh, for um, to gain a skill in another area and then um, in an organized way put them together to form a master's degree. Um, is the numbers for non-traditional students by non-traditional, non I mean, uh, adult students, students who come back to school after years, uh, students who are working full time and, and uh, continue their education, um, even at the undergraduate level, micro-credentialing is, is a huge trend right now, especially in the U.S. And finally, um, when we look at the technologies and all these ideas, and they all sound like great technologies, but uh, students um, belong into the university or uh, school or how they're connected to each other. More about the, the mental health, the psychological issues, or you know, being part of a university and being proud of it, it's becoming more and more important because after doing uh, decades of engagement research, we understand that student engagement in learning environments is really about their motivation, really about their being part of the environment. Even in the work environment, it's so important that you feel connected to your colleagues and your environment as more and more people work from home. And um, so this is becoming a huge trend as well. Um, and obviously, this is an effective domain uh, level um, objective. So, you know, the measurement of it is uh, different than the other ones. There are many other trends, but I just wanted to include these ones uh, for today. So what are uh, some of the key takeaways from this presentation? Uh, the first one is that uh, if you want a sustainable future, education plays a very important role. Uh, education is a, a discipline uh, that builds um, sort of uh, almost like a, a, a glue uh, to put together uh, social uh, structures, economic structures, environmental structures, and it increases people's quality of uh, living if you provide them, you know, uh, satisfactory education. And technology also helps us uh, to solve the problems related to uh, sustainability uh, to build it. Um, with the new and emerging technologies, there are a lot of um, uh, issues with them, uh, but without, uh, you know, scared of AI, uh, generative AI and some of the other tools uh, as a society, as individuals, as scholars, we have to continue working on these uh, to solve uh, problems. And then finally, all of these education and technology have to be part of the school curriculum in an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary manner so that students um, who will be growing in this environment uh, will find solutions to uh, those grand problems, grand challenges uh, of the environment together. So that was my presentation. Uh, again, I apologize for not joining you uh, today in real time, but um, hopefully this, this presentation provided um, some insights for you. Thank you so much and have a great conference. Professor Dr. Betül Şivas Getesekre diyor. We are thankful to Professor Betül Şivarski. We will be having a one hour break now for lunch.
Konferansımızın öğleden Welcome to the afternoon session of the day. First of all, we would be talking about health literacy and sustainable goals, uh, accessing the goals, will be handled by Ibrahim Hüseyin Cansever from the Süleyman Demirel University. Hello, distinguished professors, distinguished family of Sabri Ülker Foundation. I would like to greet you all with respect. In the morning sessions, we have listened to valuable presentations by uh, various colleagues with the theme of sustainability in the field of education and how it relates to different fields. So, as today is important, tomorrow has to be considered by each and every one of us for the future of our children, grandchildren. So with the theme of, main theme of health, I would like to talk to you about the sustainable uh, development and where Turkey stands. I would like to declare that I have no conflict of interest. This presentation takes 13 minutes. I will be talking about the sustainable development, historical development of this uh, topic and healthy and quality life uh, is the number three among the goals and the objectives with regard to this development. And I would like to talk about health literacy in the end. Sustainable development has already mentioned in the morning. It needs to be continuous. It's something to do with continuity. And something being continued uh, in the long term. That's what it emphasizes. When we look at the concept of sustainable development, uh, starting from this continuity, uh, the main th uh, definition emphasizes meeting the current generation's needs while uh, being able to do the same in the future for the future generations without endangering their situation. Just as mentioned in the morning, it has got economic, social, cultural and environmental pillars need to be handled together. When we have a look at historical development of sustainable development, before 1980, in Almata <coughs> of Kazakhstan, Health for All declaration uh, emphasized uh, sustainable development for the first time. And then came, just as handled in the morning sessions, in 1987, in Brundtland report named our joint future, this, uh, this definition was made. In years, when we came to 1992, a report was published after the Environmental and Developmental Conference of the UN, and economic, environmental, and social problems will be provided uh, will be uh, solved with such an approach, uh, they said, sustainable development approach. Then we uh, came to the year 2000, Millennium Summit of UN uh, convened uh, 189 uh, representatives of the uh, member states, and a declaration was published. When we have a look at the uh, goals, of, uh, up until 2015, uh, they are 18 number, and there are 48 indicators mentioned. Even though in a narrower perspective, uh, we had issues that uh, needed urgent action at the time. Extreme poverty, universal fundamental education being ensured, uh, development of gender equality uh, and uh, women, uh, uh, decreasing infant mortality, developing maternal health, uh, sustainability of the environment, and a global partnership for the sake of development, 
and um, he waits malaria and such uh, health issues being struggled. These are mentioned in 2015. And now we have got these 17 development goals, uh, including 169 indicators. We have seen this during the morning sessions as well. When we came to 2015, some problems became more apparent, more visible, and an integrated approach was needed to handle these issues. So more comprehensive topics were handled under specific topics. Just as in Millennium Development uh, Goals, poverty is mentioned, a more integrated approach for health, gender equality is still there, uh, clean water and sanitation, accessible uh, clean energy, and similar goals are represented here. When we have a look at the goal number 17, in order to achieve these goals, partnerships are compulsory. Among these goals, Number three refers to healthy and quality life, which is the subject of today's conference. So to ensure healthy life and welfare for everybody, these are the concepts that we see here. So when the sustainable development goals were mentioned in 2015 for 2015, a study was carried out, the synergy of different goals and uh, trade-offs were mentioned. Uh, so, when we say synergy, it means uh, progress in a specific goal is supporting the progress in another goal. But trade-off is you have to give up uh, with one of the goals in order to achieve the other one. So, sustainable development number Three goal number uh, three, six, three, five, three, four. These are direct uh, synergy. Uh, so it relates to eight goals in total. They are supporting one another. In 2015, uh, sustainable development goal number three, health and clean water and sanitation, which has an impact on 2.7 billion uh, of the world population, is the highest synergy. And the total amount uh, corresponds to 6.8 billion uh, when number three relates to those eight goals, which corresponds to 93% of the total global population. Health is very important among the goals, of course, from this perspective. There are 13 indicators below this uh, goal number three. And every four years, these goals, uh, indicators, are uh, followed up. That's what's mentioned in the declaration. Within this context, uh, the signatory countries have to uh, adapt these into their uh, systems, national systems. When we have a look at Turkey, the national health policy prepared in 1993 and the 99th development plan uh, after 2007 are quite in line. However, when it comes to development plan number 10, 11 and 12, again, sustainable development goals are directly uh, connected. The policy documents mention this. In addition to that, we have got the institutional strategic plans and the relevant sustainable development goals uh, and their relevant 
uh, line ministries uh, are very important. So these connections are made. When we have a look at the Millennium Development Goals, this is a process managed uh, with the cooperation of NGOs and state, unlike the uh, previous goals. And uh, World of Work and World of Science are also added up on these uh, NGOs uh, in uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, so uh, the policies in pol uh, development plans also integrated uh, the strategic plans accordingly. And with an understanding of uh, cooperation, uh, this process has continued until 2023 with strategic plans and development plans. We have continued our uh, commitment to sustainable development goals. And at the moment, a new page has been opened up that will take place until 2028. These are the current goals. I won't be elaborating on them. What you see on the left is the goals, like goal 3.1. Until 2030, uh, we want to reduce uh, maternal mortality rate to less than 70 in 100,000 live births. And you see other goals in this, uh, like this. Although sustainable development goal includes only one uh, different goals. Uh, will be supporting a specific uh, goal. When we have a look at another goal, like uh, in 3A, when appropriate uh, in, uh, to strengthen the practices in all countries uh, that signed the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control of WHO. Monitor, protect, offer and power policies provided by the states uh, among the best two countries stands Turkey. So packaging of cigarettes, uh, plain packaging, having pictures, uh, increasing the uh, taxes on tobacco products to uh, give up, uh, to support people to give up uh, smoking. From these perspectives, we can say that uh, what, what uh, uh, requested by Sustainable Development Goals uh, ha have been uh, achieved. Uh, we have done more than that, actually. And these are the indicators for goal number three. Both at a national and international level, uh, we are sharing these pieces of data. As you see, uh, mortality rate below the age of five, infant mortality, we are monitoring uh, these different indicators. You see other details here. All vaccinations and the targeted population follow-up. Uh, we are close to OECD. We are ad more advanced than many OECD countries, uh, actually. And we have a look at the situation, global situation. In SDG3, this is the case of the globe. So green represents the countries that uh, achieved the goal already, uh, almost all of them are yellow, orange, and red. When we have a look at the red color, the less developed countries are in red, as you can see. Turkey represents the orange uh, category. 
where do we stand when it comes to sustainable development goals? SDG index, Professor Such, under UN, this uh, uh, they they were organized and they show the situation of each country on an annual basis. As of 2015, in general terms among all SDGs, in 2016, we ranked 48 among 149 countries. When we came to 2023, among 166 countries, we ranked 72nd. When compared to OECD countries, there are some uh, challenges that's why we are now uh, we are orange in color. But about goal number three, in 17, 83.2 percent uh, is the uh, realization. At the moment, it's 84.56 percent. Although we look yellow, one of the uh, areas where uh, we rank the best is health. In general terms. The uh, acceleration is towards uh, right up, so it means a, a certain growth. And about Turkstat data, you know, we are sharing these pieces of uh, data with international organizations. Uh, when you uh, uh, click on any goal, you can see uh, the situation for uh, each indicator. So our commitment for sustainable development goals uh, is very important and uh, we are able to share this with uh, the relevant uh, parties. So is it all about indicators? They are very important. These indicators are very important. But uh, our objective is not about indicators only. When we have a look at the post-COVID-19 era, <coughs> we, we were not able to, which country provided what sort of data. These developed countries were not able to share any data. Uh, more developed countries were able to, but not at a good extent. So the main motto of SDG is leaving nobody behind. If that's the vision, then we didn't. We can say that we didn't know who was left behind. In such a case, if we want development, well, we lagged behind in providing support to the relevant countries. Then we have a look at the same era, post-COVID period, vaccination nationalism, as we name it, uh, took place. The leading countries in UN uh, said, first we. So they gave money to those research and development agencies. They wanted their societies to be vaccinated first. And such expressions were against the principle of leaving nobody behind. So this is an important point to mention. As a country, we took our vaccinations and we wanted to share some of them with other countries. And, you know, partnerships being built is very important. Acting together is very important. A collective reaction, a collective action is important, as mentioned in the morning session by a professor. Uh, so we felt like these indicators do not matter so much when it comes to reality, like COVID-19. So in the first and second conferences, of course, we accumulated a lot of experience in the field of health literacy. 
We are thankful to the uh, Sabri Ülker Foundation. Of course, uh, encouraging good health, developing it, protecting it. These are very important when we talk about health literacy. Health literacy stands at a very important point. Uh, media literacy, financial literacy. Uh, health literacy is being adapted to such different uh, areas, but still, when it comes to health, uh, this is gaining more importance. Those with a high health literacy, high level of health literacy, benefiting from health care services is taking place at a better rate and less mortality, less uh, morbidity is taking place. And when it comes to communicable diseases uh, or non-communicable diseases like cancer, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, HIV AIDS, health literacy is very important. When we have a look at the sustainable development goals, in the relevant goals, uh, maternal mortality and nutrition, they are quite relevant to health literacy. So these individuals are the cornerstones of a healthy society. So the individuals should know themselves, they should adopt, adopt a, a, a proper uh, behavior, and they need to take active role in a relationship, in their relationship with physicians. They should be making a proper use of healthcare services. Uh, and these are all making positive contributions to the society. Health professionals are providing health literacy. Uh, uh, to the uh, people and of course uh, it has got other uh, benefits when it's done sincerely in a friendly manner and the beliefs, local beliefs and traditions should be taken into consideration while providing uh, such training activities. So I hope that nobody will be left behind for the future. Thank you very much for your patience. We would like to thank Mr. Dr. Ibrahim Hussein John Sever for his contribution for this presentation. Now we would like to give the word uh, to uh, Kutsia Carlson from Dundee University Educational Studies uh, uh, Teachers Training for a Sustainable Future. So thank you very much, Sabri Ulkar Foundation, for giving me an opportunity to talk about teacher education for sustainable future. So in this talk, I will discuss the key role of teacher education practice and research for a sustainable future. I will highlight the issue of otherness or alienation and the need of a different kind of education. I will also describe different conceptualization of education for sustainable development. 
and identify ESG practices in teacher education. And I will highlight research in teacher education and its potential for the wider societal change. So to discuss the importance of teacher education for sustainable future, it is important to discuss the concepts of sustainable development and education for sustainable development. The idea of education for sustainable development is rooted in the idea of sustainable development. So first, I will discuss what sustainable development is about and um, then teacher, uh, what is education for sustainable development? And then I'll move to teacher education for sustainable future or sustainable development. So before talking about sustainable development, I would like to share some statistics. So you can see here that NASA's report shows that the average temperature of Earth has increased from 0.67 degrees Celsius to 0.889 degrees Celsius since 2005. Elhakam and their colleagues highlight that the total anthropogenic mass at the beginning of the 20th century was 3% of global biomass. However, 120 years later, it is exceeding the overall biomass in the world. So we can see 97% increase in the biomass in the past 120. Uh, uh, we can see increase in anthropogenic mass in the past 120 years. So increase is nearly 97%. But the important thing is that these statistics, which are related to environment, they could be misleading if we look at these statistics in isolation and we detach them from social and economic statistics to fully understand the meaning of these statistics or to reflect upon these statistics it is important to look at economic statistics as well so let's have a look at the economic statistics Joanne um, Hopkins and Janet Oswald in their recent research found that per capita energy use in the global south is 20.9 gigajoule, whereas it is 55.3 gigajoule in the global north. So we can see that in, uh, in the global north, energy consumption is 2.6 times higher as compared to glo the global south. So we, in other words, we can say that the rich countries are using energy more as compared to the poor countries or the developing countries. There, there is another important statistic, which is that the energy use of the top 1% in the global south is around 35 times that of the bottom 10%. So although we see disparity in energy use in the rich and uh, poor countries, we can also see disparity in the use of energy when it comes to rich and poor people. So poor people in, um, in the global south, poor 10% people in the global south, they are using 35 times lesser energy as compared to the energy used by the rich people, the top 1% of the people in the global south. This paper, uh, we can see disparity in the energy use in the um, countries um, uh, in the uh, global north, but this dis disparity is relatively lesser as compared to the disparity within the global south countries. So uh, here the disparity is 12 times as compared to the disparity in the global south, which is 35%. So uh, the, the figures that uh, energy consumption in the global south was 18.1 gigajoule per capita per year on average with 150 gigajoule per capita 
per year for the top 1% and less than 5 gigajoule per capita per year for the bottom 10%. So there is huge disparity in the energy consumption. And this disparity is because of the economic status of the people. So rich people are using more energy, uh, poor people are using less energy. So this shows economic disparities. The aforementioned statistics show that environmental problems are connected to wider inequalities. So we cannot separate environmental problems. We cannot say that if we are going to address the environmental problems, uh, we, we can address them directly. They are very complex issues and very much connected to the issue of economy. Here the question is why inequalities exist. In one of my uh, paper with uh, with uh, with a scholar Sipte Hassan, I argued that under capitalism, human beings started experiencing the manifestations of nature as something other. You might have noticed in our conversations also that sometimes we say that we need to develop a connection with nature, or that we uh, we love nature. So when we say this, it means we detach ourselves from nature. If we look at the lives of earlier people, say 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, human beings were a part of nature. They were not separate from nature. They could not say that nature is something other. But with Capitalism, with the, with the rise of capitalism, we can say that nature is taken as other. And it is not about nature, nature which in, includes humans, other humans, and other um, uh, non-humans things as well. So when we say other, means that we cannot associate with others, whether they are trees or they are rivers or they are seas or they are other humans or other species. So once something has got a status of other, then we, we, we can exploit them. When you feel that you are part of the whole nature, then you are not other. Nothing is other to you. It means that you, you cannot exploit others because there is no other. So that is something which we have argued in our paper that under capitalism, human beings started experiencing the manifestations of nature as something other. So we may label otherness as the capitalist ideology of nature. Following this ideology, human beings have developed a system of intraspecies and interspecies hierarchies. We can see hierarchies um, all around us, and uh, as scholars have argued that these hierarchies are product of uh, capitalist, the capitalist ideology. Vata believes that otherness for humans as well as non-humans provides the foundation for the system of hierarchy. So one way to look at sustainable development is that to address the issue of otherness. Sustainable development has been the largely conceptualized in terms of uh, current and future generations sustainability, but it can be conceptualized in terms of addressing the issue of otherness, which leads to um, uh, unsustainability and inequalities. So uh, what is education for sustainable development then? So to address the complex issues of inequalities and unsustainability, there is a need to address the issue of otherness. And education for sustainable development can play a key role in this regard. So in this presentation, I am using sustainable development and sustainable future, these two concepts interchangeably. So education for sustainable development or ESD can be viewed as a set of content and processes that leads 
to raising students' awareness about the complexity and interconnectedness of the issues of sustainability or unsustainability and help students to engage in collective pro-sustainability practices. When I say practices, I built on the framework of Camus and his colleagues, and it is about sayings, doings, relating. So practices, the concept of practice is large enough, it is wide enough, and it includes everything related to our sayings, doings, and relatings. There are three broad traditions of um, conceptualization of, religion, of uh, education for sustainable development. According to the fact-based tradition, ESG is a kind of education that provides scientific solutions to the problems of unsustainability. Education that helps people to learn about recycling, producing um, products which have um, a sustainable life cycle. So it is more technological and research-based stuff. And um, the proponents of um, this tradition say that ESG should prepare people who can engage with, uh, who can find scientific problems of uh, unsustainability. The normative tradition, this is the tradition uh, which has been advocated by most of the scholars. According to this tradition, the problems of sustainability or unsustainability are primarily moral issues, issues of values. So what we need to do is that we need to provide an education where people learn the values of respect for others. When we, I say others means humans and non-humans. So um, Anderson and Oman, uh, they uh, identified the different traditions of ESD and they said that ESD, according to this tradition, that is normative tradition, Tradition. ESD is a kind of education that focuses on raising learners' awareness about unsustainability and transforming people's values and lifestyles to save the natural world. The third tradition is the pluralistic tradition. So a pluralistic tradition, the underlying belief in, in the pluralistic tradition of um, ESD is that a change in individuals' behaviors and values really do not contribute towards sustainability or it cannot guarantee um, a sustainable future unless there is some political action or legal action taken. So ESD is a kind, according to this tradition, ESD is a kind of education that engages learners in the processes of critical dialogue and democratic participation to help them to understand the complexity of interwoven economic, environmental, and social issues, and that they can be addressed by critical actions at a political level. So here the important thing is that sometimes um, we feel that if students are aware of environmental issues or economic inequalities, or social inequalities, so they would become agents of sustainability or that would lead to sustainable development. Um, it is important that people know about, our students know about these issues, but they need to understand the complexity of issues as well. As I mentioned earlier, that if we look at environmental problems in isolation, then it could be very much misleading. So the important thing is, is that our students understand the interconnectedness of environmental, social, and economic issues and take pro-sustainability actions individually, collectively, and make some um, impact on the political decision-making. So. A uh, uh, pluralistic tradition looks at ESD in a much more holistic way. We can see an emphasis on education for sustainable development in sustainable development goals as well. So I have just taken uh, an extract from goal four and target 4.7. 
which is essentially about sustainable development. And the target says that ensure that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including among others through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and non-violence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and of cultural contribution to sustainable development. So in this target, target 4.7, we can see a lot of focus on values and lifestyle. And we can say that the target 4.7 is very much aligned to normative tradition of education for sustainable development. We, we cannot say that some tradition is wrong or right. So these are different ways of conceptualizing education for sustainable development. So here the question is, why teacher education for sustainable future? Why do we need teacher education for sustainable future? We understand that there should be education for sustainable development, but now well, we talk about why teacher education is needed for sustainable future. Research shows that teachers influence or teachers are the key player who enact education for sustainable development. So here you can see, um, I, I have quoted, um, uh, with, uh, I've quoted uh, some words from UNESCO and uh, Laurie's work. According to them, students' learning can be negatively impacted if teachers do not have good understanding of education for sustainable development. So it is understandable that if teachers themselves don't know about education for sustainable development, it will not be possible for them to help their uh, students learn about sustainability. They will not be in a position to, to organize ESD processes, which can help students to learn about sustainability. Considering the key role of teachers in ESD implementation, UNESCO developed guidelines for reorienting teacher education. These guidelines are available on the web on the UNESCO's website. So it would be great if you read those guidelines in detail. Let's have a look uh, at some other reasons for teacher education for sustainable future. So initial teacher education pro in, in teacher preparation programs are the key drivers in advancing the agenda of ESD. So Buckler and Creech um, also identified this in their research. Research shows that many educators form their views about what it means to be an educator during initial teacher education. This is a critical area for action. So again, this emphasizes why uh, this, this highlights the role of teacher education in sustainability. So the last one, Courtney and Reed note that teacher preparation programs can influence student teachers' conceptions of ESD. So if teacher preparation programs are not providing enough opportunities to the student, to the student teachers to develop their ESD conceptions, then definitely uh, the student teachers would lack um, uh, would lack in understanding of the problems related to sustainability and they would also not have they would, they would not be able to develop competences required from the sustainability educators so teachers teacher education programs or teacher uh, preparation program programs have a key role in advancing the agenda of sustainable future here the question is what is teacher education for sustainable future? So um, I have included um, some ideas which I took from Tilbury's work. Uh, in simple words, teacher education for sustainable future or sustainable development refers to a set of content and processes that empower student teachers to act as ESD educators. They are expected to demonstrate powerful knowledge of sustainability education. Here I have 
had taken the idea of powerful knowledge from Michael Young's work, where he talks about powerful knowledge, powerful disciplinary knowledge. So I believe that uh, teachers should have powerful knowledge of sustainability education. When I say that they should have powerful knowledge of sustainability education means they should be aware of the, the content of ESG. Content of ESG refers to content related to society, content related to environment, content related to economy and their interconnectedness. So one is that they should have knowledge of power, knowledge of ESG content. They should have powerful knowledge of ESG processes and they should have powerful knowledge of ESG outcomes. So Tilbury identified the following processes as ESG processes. These processes are collaboration, dialogue, inclusion, processes of engaging whole system, curriculum and pedagogical innovation, and processes of active and participatory learning. So teacher educators, uh, educators, ESD educators should know about these processes. Uh, can we further identify ESD learning, or we can say the learning outcomes of ESD as learning to think critically, learning to use information and communication technologies, learning to ask critical questions, learning to clarify one's own values, learning to envision more positive and sustainable futures, learning to think systematically, learning to, uh, learning to respond through applied learning and learning to explore the dialectic between tradition and innovation. So these are different learnings which Tilbury identified. Um, in some literature, learning outcomes have been mentioned in terms of competencies. In some other literature, learning outcomes uh, in teacher education programs have been mentioned in terms of competencies. So uh, uh, there could be different nomenclature, but the thing is that uh, as a result of teacher preparation program, Teacher, teacher, ESD educators should become aware of ESD content, ESD uh, processes, and ESD outcomes. So there are some uh, practices which we can see in, uh, in literature, and uh, the, these practices have been reported in literature. So considering the key role of teacher preparation programs in promoting ESD, Teacher education programs in many Turkish universities have included ESD as a standalone course. So there are many, um, there, there are some universities in Pakistan which have included um, ESD as a standalone course. And in recent report of uh, Bon and his colleagues show that Turkish universities have also included ESD um, as a standalone course. So this is one practice which we can see in different parts of the world. So recognizing the key role of teacher education in promoting ESD in K-12 education, ESD has been made a part of professional standards for teachers in some countries such as Scotland and Sweden. The last thing is related to hidden curriculum. That there are some countries where, and there are some institutions where we do not see any standalone course on ESD. We also do not see some uh, integration of ESD in different courses, but we can see that uh, sustain, uh, ESD is a part of the wider hidden curriculum of the institution. So Arjun Walls has written a lot on hidden curriculum and the role of hidden curriculum. So hidden curriculum is not visible, but it allows people to experience education for sustainable development. So there are different practices um, through which um, teacher education programs are promoting uh, sustainable education for sustainable development. So here um, are some examples of integrated practice uh, where uh, teacher education program or courses integrated some stuff related to ESD. So the first study is Zong's study. Uh, it, it, its title is Integrating Global Sustainability into Social Studies Teachers Education, a Collaborative Self-Study. Ecological Footprinting, this is a second study. Its potential as a tool for change in pre-service teacher education. 
Third one, inquiry into sustainability issues by pre-service teachers of pedagogy to enhance sustainability consciousness. So in this study, I used undergraduate research as a pedagogy and uh, included it in one of my courses. And the last one which I have picked, you can find many examples where um, teacher educators have integrated uh, different aspects of education for sustainable development in their teaching. So when I look when we look at research in teacher education, we can see that uh, the research that has been published, um, the, uh, we can I, um, we can categorize that research into descriptive and case studies, exploratory studies, explanatory studies, mixed method studies, and critical action research and participatory action research. So what is the significance of this kind of research and how research on teacher education is advancing the agenda of uh, sustain the sustainable development? So it is very much important that in teacher uh, education that, that we get research that researchers are interested in investigating problems related to teacher education. So if we go to the previous slide, so here, um, uh, most of them are case studies. The third one is critical action research, which I carried out. The sec second one is evaluative study. And the first one is more like a case study. So it is important that if teacher educators are involved some sort of uh, sustainability practice, so they are sharing their practice. They are investigating their own practice with uh, uh, they are investigating their own practice using research tools or someone else is investing their practice. So there is a lot to learn from such practices. So this kind of research is helping others to learn about what kind of uh, practice is going on and it gives an idea to other researchers and teacher educators at how to plan their own teaching. For example, when I read work of uh, this um, Gorman and De Davis work, that is ecological footprinting, its potential as a tool for change in pre-service teacher education. So I got an idea of to integrate uh, the concept of sustainability education in my own teaching. So then I did. So I also reported that. And I'm sure that after reading the article which I published, other educators would have got an idea. So it is very important that um, uh, teacher educators, they uh, share their practice with others and they investigate their practice systematically uh, so that it is um, uh, it can be published. Then there are exploratory studies also, uh, which have investigated uh, uh, ideas related to uh, system sustainability and sustainability education. There are explanatory studies done after quantitative studies to explain different things which emerge as a result of quantitative surveys. There are mixed method studies as well and critical action research. My own research was critical action research, which I mentioned on the previous slide and participatory action research. It is usually believed that critical action research has natural affinity to um, sustainability education because sustainability education, sustainability problems are mostly affecting the marginalized groups. The critical action research is done with the marginalized groups. So there are different kinds of research which is going on in the field and they are advancing the agenda of uh, research in teacher education, uh, research in education for sustainable development. So uh, it is important for teacher educators to be engaged in ca different kinds of research. So here, here are some references. And thank you very much for um, listening to this uh, talk. Thank you very much. Dr. Kutsuya-Kalsuma. Would you like to thank doctors? Good to see you, Carl. So now we're going to have a short coffee break and now we're going to continue with two other presentations. Thank you.
Konferansımızın sonlarına doğru yak- As we are coming towards the end of our conference, we would like to listen to Pınar Sökülmez Kaya Professor from Samsun 19 Mayıs University Nutrition Dietetics Department about healthy and environmentally sustainable diets. Distinguished participants, I would like to welcome you all. I wish the best for this international conference on nutrition, health, literacy and education. I would like to thank our professor for this kind invitation and all the team who organized this event. I would like to talk about a sustainable diet uh, models uh, for sustainability. So sustainability is about uh, meeting the needs uh, without giving concessions on the future needs, uh, performance of meeting uh, the needs of the future. In 87, our uh, joint future uh, report uh, uh, was published, and for the first time, this concept appeared in this manner. With the ecologic changes taking place, continuously increasing extreme consumption habits have led to uh, appearance of such a concept. Economic, ecologic, and socially, social conditions being uh, uh, sustained uh, are important here. So uh, for 2015, uh, we can say that uh, 15 SDGs were identified by UN. The first one is the uh, ending the poverty, then ending the hunger, and then comes health and quality life. So these three uh, goals are very important for us, uh, for our uh, field. Now we have a look at the uh, concepts of sustainable nutrition. According to 2019 data, 690 million people are struggling uh, with uh, hunger and around 2 billion people are not able to access to safe nutrition. So, uh, Secure uh, food is important. Nutrition is important for each age group. And with the destruction on the natural resources, and uh, there are some references with regard to uh, healthy nutrition when we say sustainable uh, nutrition. This expression was used by Gasso and Clancy for the first time. Uh, not only sustainability of health, but also sustainability of agricultural systems is mentioned here. Uh, so FAO uh, definition is also seen on this slide. Biodiversity is mentioned, ecosystem, uh, respect for ecosystem, safeguarding, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically affordable, adequate when it comes to nutrition. Such uh, wordings uh, are used in FAO. There are six main components of sustainable nutrition. The first one is uh, uh, health, uh, which is continued by biodiversity, uh, equality, uh, just trade, accessibility, etc. Then we have a look at sustainable nutrition principles. We see, of course, the importance of uh, adequate and balanced diet. Animal-based proteins, eggs, uh, meat, milk, rather than these, um, plant-based sources should be increased, uh, is said. At least five portions of vegetables and fruit should be consumed. Sugar, oil, salt should be uh, avoided as much as possible. Consumption prevalence should be considered. And of course, uh, increasing the high quality uh, seeds consumption is also encouraged. Uh, about fishing, uh, there are some uh, recommendations, of course, uh, fishing at proper times, also consumption of vegetables and fruit uh, in the relevant, in the appropriate uh, seasons, and to achieve ideal weight. 
uh, is also mentioned here. As much as possible, uh, overweight should be avoided. All nutrition, uh, you know, with an overall approach of nutrition, uh, we should consider different approaches uh, about red meat, processed meat uh, products, uh, animal-based uh, uh, fat uh, consumption should be reduced. Uh, proper conditions should be in place for storing and no food should be wasted. Uh, different parts of, of uh, products should be used uh, for different purposes, uh, reducing packages and uh, avoiding plastic use is very important. Recyclable uh, materials should be uh, preferred. Reduction of consumption of food, which leads to negative environmental load, uh, is important uh, to mitigate the environmental impact. So, uh, replacing the, the, such uh, food is important. Discussions are taking place about sustainable nutrition models. They are focused on red meat reduction, but actually, for sustainability perspective, <clears throat> dairy products, eggs, fish, uh, less dependent diet should be encouraged. Uh, the transition to plant-based protein uh, sources is important. Biologic diversity, land use, water use, climate, human health, uh, uh, these different uh, uh, aspects should be considered. So the purpose is to make sure that an optimal growth and development takes place for each individual. Functionality and welfare of people should be uh, emphasized. All sorts of malnutrition should be avoided, including in adequate nutrition, micronutrient uh, deficiency, overweight, and uh, others. Also, non-communicable diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, they need to be reduced. Greenhouse gas, water footprint, carbon footprint should be reduced and food waste should be minimized. Sustainable diets. In 2010, FAO uh, defined sustainable diets in this manner. Biologic diversity, ecosystem, uh, uh, respective and protective safeguarding towards the ecosystem, culturally acceptable, uh, affordable, uh, accessible, and uh, such properties are mentioned. From the sustainability perspective, especially uh, environmental impact of animal-based products are higher. That's the reason why such diets should be uh, replaced uh, with plant-based sources. This is a general agreement. Uh, in all states of uh, member states of U uh, UN, uh, uh, uh, replacing uh, uh, the current nutrition is uh, important. Uh, that, that, that would be leading to a reduction of uh, 8%. Uh, when we have a look at the life cycle of products, uh, you know, raw material being prepared if needed, taking it from the nature, uh, transforming it uh, after being waste, and uh, such evaluation is important. So the results uh, are mentioned by some different indicators like economic footprints. Ecologic footprint uh, is one of the tools uh, that show to what extent individuals live uh, and uh, trace on the nature. Of course, all sorts of uh, soil, water amount measurement in order to eliminate uh, the waste. And carbon footprint mentioned was mentioned by Wecker Nagel uh, in 1990s as a part of the, as a sub uh, group of ecologic footprint. Uh, directly or indirectly uh, done activities lead to this. And when it comes to water footprint, it's about a measurement that is uh, of uh, water that is needed for production of specific products. When we have a look at different components that have an impact on greenhouse gas in the uh, life cycle of products, transportation is important. While transporting gen uh, energy use, uh, 
is uh, important for fridges and this uh, leads to an increase of greenhouse gas emissions uh, so uh, cold chain uh, is compulsory for some specific products that's the reason why uh, this this component uh, is mentioned uh, another point is food uh, waste, of course, uh, lack of coordination through the supply chain, lack of adequate packaging uh, or storing conditions, planning problems, such uh, things also lead to waste. Another component is retail. In retail, mostly fridges are used and energy use uh, and leakages of fridges are very important. Packaging of course, uh, making use of too much packaging is negative for the sake of environment. Of course, we need to protect uh, products to make sure that they are safe, they are healthy, and waste can, can be reduced in this manner. Now we have a look at the consumption chain. Of course, in the consumption, con consumer step of the uh, food chain, selection of food we, uh, are uh, main factors for waste and uh, transportation. Uh, when we consider cooking, uh, low emission uh, products are important to have. Uh, when we talk about greenhouse gas emission, the most important uh, responsible part is the, of course, consumption of food. Of course, this is important for the public health and it has a big potential to have an impact on environment. Animal-based uh, uh, uh, products uh, uh, ha have an important impact on greenhouse gas emission. And of course, uh, uh, this human uh, uh, the, the greenhouse gas release that is due to the human beings, uh, this is taking place by 14.5%. In order to say that greenhouse gas emission is low, uh, they need to be uh, more than less, sorry, less than one kilogram per carbon dioxide e per kilogram. Uh, this is the case for pasta, for breads, for cereals, etc. <clears throat> including fruit and vegetables. Uh, when the emission is between one to four, uh, this is the meat level, chicken, dairy products, yogurt, eggs, rice, um, uh, melon, uh, cauliflower, etc. cetera. Uh, when it's more than four kilograms, this is fish and red meat. From the perspective of diet models, there are many actually in this group. For us, <clears throat> let me talk about each. I want to focus on the most sustainable ones. As the dietitians, what we suggest most is, and what we want to recommend is, a Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diets appeared for the first time in 50s. In 1960, Angel Case study showed that uh, this is a, a general, a, a common uh, co uh, nutrition culture in seven countries. UNESCO uh, accepted it as a, a cultural heritage for the humanity. And today it has got environmental, economic, social, cultural uh, dimensions when it comes to its benefits. This is the nutrition pyramid of the Mediterranean diet. In addition to the benefits, it has low environmental impact. It has rich biodiversity. Sociocultural uh, food values are high and it supports a local economy. That's the reason why it's a sustainable diet model. A healthy and sustainable nutrition model, uh, this Mediterranean diet, has a high amount of plant-based uh, food. Fruit, vegetables, uh, dry seeds, cereals, uh, uh, olive oil, uh, chicken, uh, fish, uh, dairy products, uh, red meat, and uh, similar food. 
you see the pyramid on the right hand. Of course, we should uh, be consuming the uh, the bottom part uh, the most. The lifestyle of this uh, Mediterranean region is also important to mention. Then we have a look at this diet. Fruit, vegetables, bread, other cereals, yeah. wheat. Uh, these, these are frequently consumed. Uh, olive oil is preferred. Uh, red meat once or twice a month. Uh, fish is uh, advised uh, uh, to be frequently uh, consumed. And uh, there are some discrepancies among countries. And wine consumption is also mentioned in this regard. Uh, uh, average uh, Netherlands diet, vegan diet, and Mediterranean diet are included uh, in a uh, set of six diets. When it comes to sustainability, according to the Greenhouse Gas in, uh, Release Index, a 20% uh, reduction objective can be achieved by Mediterranean diet. This has been put. DASH diet is another one. In this diet, uh, hypertension, which is a very important preventable diseases, uh, this nutrition is recommended. So, adequate num uh, amount of uh, four uh, food groups are consumed uh, at each meal. So optimal nutrition is recommended in this regard. Energy value is low, uh, fiber amount is high, vitamins, minerals, rich, full uh, cereals, uh, food. Also, saturated fat uh, are limited, sodium uh, intake is limited in DASH diet. Uh, cholesterol reduction is aimed, uh, fat uh, is also re reduced, physical activity is encouraged, uh, fibers are encouraged. This is not a uh, weight uh, losing program, but it's an approach of nutrition. So, uh, DASH diet model is focusing on vegetables, fruit, uh, and fish and seedy uh, uh, oil seeds, uh, drinks, beverages, and uh, sorry, beverages and uh, red meat intake is uh, restricted. It is able to control hypertension and other chronic diseases with DASH diet. It has an association with less greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, its associations with other uh, sorts of uh, uh, food uh, is also uh, studied on. So, for the sake of sustainability, <coughs> this is uh, the most environment friendly, uh, one of the most environment friendly uh, models. Uh, double pyramid model is another one. It is similar to the previous ones. Uh, what we see here is in Italy, Barilla Food and Nutrition Center developed this model. Contributions of this food and environmental impacts are handled here. Uh, the Mediterranean model is added up with a reverse model here which represents minor changes on our habits can lead to major results. Another model is planetary health diet. Experts from different disciplines from 16 different countries came together uh, for the first time Commission of Eight Lancet uh, published this. Uh, this is a nutrition model. Uh, so this commission 
uh, says that if we are able to provide healthy and sustainable nutrition for people, if we make everything more sustainable, if we reduce waste, uh, this is a proof that it's possible to save the world, save the earth. And if we can achieve that, we can prevent that of 11 million people. This is one of the outputs of this study. Might let as we name it, when we have a look at the pattern of a plate, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables uh, forms the half of the plate, uh, where uh, you know they reproduce animal-based proteins, plant-based proteins, unsaturated oil, added sugar uh, and uh, grains full grains, uh, these are quite similar to the Mediterranean pyramids. Another diet model is the Nordic diet. Uh, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, so Nordic uh, countries uh, developed this. And the main characteristics of this diet is uh, berries uh, are very important here. Vegetables like broccoli, like root vegetables, uh, uh, and oily fish like salmon or quinos, uh, full cereals, unsaturated uh, oil, canola oil, uh, and uh, similar things. So uh, for weight loss and for a sense of fullness, uh, this is important and cardiovascular risk factors are lowered. Inflammation control can be provided. Uh, so, uh, uh, Scandinavian diet is like Mediterranean diet, uh, plant-based uh, nutrition is again here, canola, canola, uh, canola uh, uh, oil is there. When we have a look at Nordic diets, fruit, vegetables, fish and f uh, full cereals are there. Uh, there are four main components, health, gastronomic power, sustainability and preservation of Nordic identity. The biggest difference between Mediterranean and Nordic is about oil. Another model of diet is vegetarian, uh, vegetarian uh, diet. Uh, Plant-based uh, products are used. Uh, of course, uh, meat and fish are not consumed, but dairy products and eggs are added up on this uh, diet. Um, again, cereals, vegetables, fruit, uh, oily seeds, uh, uh, and similar products are there in vegetarian uh, uh, diet. When it comes to vegetarian and vegan diet, as there is this reduction of consumption of meats, we see less greenhouse gas emission. In Italy, uh, the highest environmental impact and the uh, uh, lowest health scores take place with animal-based diets. In the United States, uh, uh, lacto-ova vegetarian diet was compared to uh, animal-based food. Energy, soil, water use uh, is uh, uh, higher uh, uh, when uh, compared. Vegetarian diets can be classified like lacto-ovo, lacto, ovo, and uh, strict vegetarian or vegan. Uh, of, uh, when uh, planned carefully, vegetarian uh, diets have positive impacts on health. At the same time, uh, when compared to omnivores, uh, less environmental impact is taking place. But in the long term, they need to be followed up and vital micronutrient deficiencies should be avoided. We should be careful. And this is uh, one of the outputs mentioned in this study.
we, we should remember this. All these vegetarian uh, diet scenarios, when compared with others, not always positive results were taken, like uh, rather than uh, beef or uh, uh, uh, sheep uh, uh, meat, uh, more research are needed, it says, in different contexts in order to optimize the diets, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, perspective, from that perspective. More research is needed, they say. So in vegetarian diet, maximum health and environmental impact benefits should be provided uh, with more research in this field. Conclusions. Sustainability is about making better use of sources for better results, to leave the earth uh, in a better manner to the next generations about which diets to be better. You know, there is no one single answer to that. Instead, each diet should have its, uh, do have uh, their own benefits. Of course, the nutrition habits of consumers uh, should be taken into consideration. They should be recommended to us healthier, more environment-friendly diets. Otherwise, negative environmental impacts will be increasing. Both inadequate nutrition and uh, overnutrition should be struggled against and reducing the uh, waste, increasing the safe uh, security, food security, minimizing environmental impacts are very important. And to this end, accessible, economically affordable systems should be in place. I would like to thank for listening to my presentation. And as a last word, I would like to say that among our audience, we should have some dietitians, some professionals in our field. I would like to make a suggestion. Uh, the sustainable diet models are forming the diet plans. So these diet models uh, should be arranged individually. Uh, Gluten-free, uh, or karatai uh, diet, such false uh, diet models should be avoided. Uh, this is a big responsibility on dietitians. I'm sure that they will be doing their job uh, uh, in their best manner. So while making planning for individuals, while providing information to the to society, uh, we will be suggesting these models, but at the same time, while struggling individually, we should be careful uh, so that they can be included in their daily lives. Thank you. We would like to thank Professor Pınar Sökülmezkaya for her presentation. Now the last presentation holder is Feliza Tibitz, Professor from Utrecht University Human Rights Education and UNESCO Human Rights and Higher Education, who is going to be talk about transformative education to overcome climate changes. İklim değişikliği ile başa çıkmak için dönüşümce eğitimli başlıklı sunumunu birlikte dinleyeceğiz. Felisa Tibbets, I'm UNESCO Chair of Human Rights and Higher Education and Chair in Human Rights Education at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And it's my pleasure and honor to be joining you today for your conference. I regret that I cannot be there live, um, virtually or in person. Um, but I very much appreciate the invitation of the organizers to make a contribution um, in this way. And I wish you all success um, with this amazing conference topic and the speakers that you have um, today and the discussion I presume that you'll be also having, having uh, around the conference itself. What I'd like to focus on uh, today is transformative education for addressing climate change. I know that you have many uh, wide topics that you're going to be addressing in this conference. My focus is going to be specifically on education and in particular as it relates to sustainable development and, and climate change. Um, so that's where I'm headed today. So I'd like to step back first and ask us to think about the future and how we might 
reimagine our futures. Education is very much linked with any kind of notion of how we see ourselves as citizens, how our countries see themselves as sovereign states, but also how we see ourselves in of creating a world that we want to live in. Of course, this is very relevant for the topic of environmentalism and, and climate change as well. So what is the future that we want and how do we make it happen? Well, the United Nations has answered that question through the Sustainable Development Goals, and which you're very likely to be familiar with already. So there are 17 of them. One of them actually exclusively de uh, devoted to, uh, to, to climate, cha climate change and sustainability, but also um, Sustainable Development Goal, Goal 4.0 is devoted exclusively to education, which is seen as a kind of transversal support actually for all the Sustainable Development Goals including that related to ESD. Obviously, with the threat of climate change so familiar to all of us now, it's calling for a green transition of our societies. So one of the visions of our future, which we need to make real already now, is the greening of our societies so that we do not exceed the 1.5 um, Celsius increase um, of temperatures that have been warned to be a threshold um, which if we cross will make it extremely difficult to manage increasingly um, severe weather conditions related to climate change. So this is really very real. And, and as I'm recording this for you all, actually, COP28 has just, it's just the second day of COP28 in Dubai. Uh, I'm not there, but uh, maybe um, some of those of you who are going to be listening to my <laughs> presentation uh, next week will have been there or will be there at that time. So Sustainable Development Goal 4.7, bringing us back to the SDGs, actually has a target linked specifically with um, what I would call values-oriented approaches to education. So backing up a little bit, SDG 4.0 is really about quality education, it's about gender mainstreaming. It's, um, it, goes, it takes us beyond access to education to what constitutes a good education. Um, but it also, has set aside this very particular target, 4.7, um, to reinforce the importance of certain kinds of values and capabilities being integrated into what would be a, a kind of a typical curriculum in our national systems, typical curriculums addressing numeracy, literacy, and so forth. And these, um, and these um, approaches are intended to address globalization both its positives and its, its negatives, climate change, economic inequalities within and across nations. And uh, there are three really key approaches within 4.7. Uh, the one I have at the top is Education for Sustainable Development, ESD. That's the wider frame for 4.7, but it's, it was, it's really basically a, a frame for uh, uh, co-approaches, I would say, including global citizenship education, which you can see on the bottom left hand, of the triangle and peace and human rights education. Each of these approaches is expected to be a kind of, of themes that would be transversally integrated across different uh, traditional subjects. And of course, in non-formal education, these are their own standalone courses or trainings. So there, um, there's very different ways in which they can be showing up, but the idea is that they would be made available to everybody in the schooling system and would be part of lifelong learning. So education for sustainable development is what I'm going to be focusing on now in relation to transformative education um, um, for partly because that's the work that I'm working on right now with, with UNESCO. So UNESCO has been promoting education for sustainable development for decades. And prior to ESD, they had something that they called Edu you know, environmental education. Environmental education, both at the United Nations, but also in civil society organizations, began like in the 70s and 80s with the environmental movement, and which was a movement that called attention, for example, to pollution. There was a time when we really weren't aware of, of, of the impacts of chemicals from our factories, for example, and river systems. So anyway, environmental education eventually evolved into um, what is now known as Education for Sustainable Development. And inside of the definition of ESD, you can see on this slide is this very clear definition of what empowerment means with ESD. ESD empowers learners of all ages 
with the knowledge, skills, values, and agency to make informed decisions and take individual and collective action to change society and care for the planet. So, um, so this links up with this idea of transformative education. And um, although UNESCO has traditionally seen ESD and other values like global citizenship education, peace and human rights education, these are all intended to empower and motivate learners to, um, to make changes in their society. So I wanna say already that the transformation piece of these approaches is partly internal, having to do with intrinsic motivation and capabilities for the individual, but it's also understand that that transformation is intended to flow into their actions to transform societies, their communities that they live in and their, their national and global communities as well. So um, back to UNESCO. So UNESCO has taken a strong cue from the recent, in the recent years, the youth climate change activists, the climate justice activists, and, um, and, and refocused attention on ESG with a specific focus on climate change, which is absolutely wonderful. And I don't know about you, but I have been extremely motivated by, um, by youth activism, very much so, so that I've done a couple of studies now that's linked up with that. UNESCO too, as with other UN agencies, has been trying to understand what youth perspectives are around ESD and, um, and, and, and what they're calling for, especially in their schooling systems. So there's a publication that just came up from UNESCO last year, where it's really clearly showing that youth in their surveys of youth are demanding quality climate change education. And these same reports are showing that there's a, a paucity of knowledge amongst youth around climate change conditions. So even though youth is sort of aware, if they're not already active, that they're just they're generally aware of the climate change hazards, but they don't necessarily know what that's about, you know, from a scientific point of view and also what they can do in order to address it. Um, very, very important. So um, youth action, um, as I mentioned before, has been extremely um, inspiring for me. And the UN has actually tried to capture it in some of these documents that you'll see at the blue at the bottom of this slide. There's now a youth manifesto for action on climate change. There's a youth declaration on transforming education, which also includes uh, climate change as a subtopic. And then there's a global youth statement. So the UN and many other uh, government leaders and intergovernmental organizations and civil society organizations are all um, trying to validate, capture, and, and actually work with youth to uh, in recognizing and addressing these really pressing issues of our time. Which brings me to the UNESCO Greening Curriculum Guidance um, that I am working on with actually two of the presenters at this conference. It's my privilege to work with Mustafa Öztürk, excuse me for the pronunciation, and also Christina Walk, who's also a presenter. Um, these are absolutely marvelous colleagues, and we're of uh, three of the um, seven authors, eight authors, I guess, who have been brought in to, um, to work on this guidance. And the guidance will be uh, coming out next summer. We're just now uh, still in the drafting and revision process. And so UNESCO has decided um, to using as their basis the earlier work on education for sustainable development to focus in on greening more widely with again a focus on uh, um, on the adaptation and mitigation of climate change the goal of the greening curriculum guidance the forthcoming guidance is that all member states have mainstreamed esd in their national curricula and included climate change as a curricular component by 2030. This is very specific and obviously linked with the SDGs. Again, the idea is that um, this mainstreaming is going to be transformative. It's going to support all learners to acquire knowledge, skills, values to tackle climate change and achieve sustainability. And UNESCO's perspective in the GCG is lifelong. So even though it's member states um, that are obviously members of the United Nations that um, through their formal education system can be expected by UNESCO to um, incorporate ESD. Um, the guidance itself is, is, is, is widely conceptualized for non-formal education, informal education, and lifelong learning. So it's not just restricted to the schooling system, although that's obviously a very important system to be looking at. So 
So what is the vision of the Greening Curriculum Guidance? Um, as I mentioned already, uh, the first is that um, substantive education for sustainable development would be required for all students. At a minimum, it would be addressed in the science fields, the natural science fields, which is where we do find it now If we, for those countries that do address ESD. Um, but the idea, which I'll share just in just a moment with you, is that also it would be transversely incorporated into the social sciences as also the humanities. And also the other, the other part of this vision for um, greening curriculum is that it will embody those pedagogies that we already know from SDG 4.7 and its earlier histories um, really activate students. So we know that the methodology should be participatory. The pedagogy should involve critical pedagogy. It should be action oriented. So this is not new. Um, but it is intended to be revived again through the imperative of bringing ESD and climate change education into the schools. And again, not just only in teaching and learning processes, but also the whole school environment. The whole school environment is also um, a perspective that is going to be uh, presented in the um, greening curriculum guidance. So here now I want to show you, give you a little of a, a glimpse into the domains that are going to be addressed in the greening curriculum guidance. And then I'm going to move into transformative learning. So um, in the center, you can see here what I have mentioned already. The idea is that ESD with the climate change um, emphasis is going to be addressed holistically and transversally, meaning it's not just going to be in the natural sciences, as important as that is, it's going to be also um, um, threaded through um, relevant courses in the social sciences and also even in humanities. So there are three domains of education for sustainable development, environment, economy, and society represented in this triangle. And for each of these three domains, we have two key concepts. And I'm not gonna go into detail about what's inside of those concepts, but I just wanna give you an idea about this wide frame, which I think is very exciting for helping to fulfill youth demands to bring climate change education into schools and, and beyond. So in the environment section, for example, we have climate science, typically what you're finding now, if there's anything in the schooling systems and also ecosystems and diversity, very much science related. And we have um, these two key concepts with us and, and these get broken down into topics and key learner outcomes and so forth in the actual guidance. Then we move to society on the bottom right hand corner. And here we have two key concepts, one being resilience building and the other climate justice, which Christina Wong is going, she may address with you um, in her presentation for this conference. Um, so again, this is really about uh, dealing with our own eco anxieties or our, our learners' eco anxieties if we're educators, um, really having um, understanding how we can both mitigate and also adapt to these new changes in climate. And climate justice drawing our attention to those who are most vulnerable, who need extra protection, issues of global inequalities about who is issuing you know, the carbon, who is, who is making those carbon emissions most, and who is um, unfortunately bearing the brunt of that, even if it's um, not being produced by their own countries, the global north, global south issues here. And then we move to the economy, where we have, uh, very interesting, we have addressing basically green economies. So also thinking about the private sector as, as part of the stakeholder groups, um, very much needing to be engaged in climate change and sustainable lifestyles, which is the key concept that Mustafa is addressing um, in his work. Um, so this is sort of gives you an idea of the, of the wider frame of climate change education that's envisioned again to get youths activated. So if you think about society, for example, that allows us to think about youth and other learners influencing persons with the power and authority to, um, to pass new policies, for example, that support movement away from fossil fuel dependency to alternative energies. So if you think about it, it makes sense, right? It's not just about knowing the science of the environment. It's also about understanding how we can you know, work within our own communities or political systems or non-formal, um, um, you know, power structures um, to to try to make changes to help um, make make the world safer for us and and to reduce carbon emissions as well. And the um, in the economy section as well, the post-carbon 
society is really interesting looking at ways in which you know ways in which um which um investments or um um post carbon economies economies um might look you know moving away from fossil fuel to wind and solar really fascinating looking at that ec- the economic dimension of all this and then Mustafa's work on sustainable lifestyles really thinking about what we can do um daily in our own lives and the lives of our families and our schools if we're in a school or organization to address climate change and promote sustainability. So now I want to shift into transformative um, uh, transformative learning. And as I mentioned before, my very simple understanding of this really is it's uh, we're thinking about transformation in education and learning um, in, in, in terms of the individual and their capacity to development, their motivation to have a sustainable lifestyle, for example, or, in, or influence um, um, others uh, with with power to to make changes in policies, but that obviously is idea that's transformative also in terms of, of society, right? We want to see uh, reduced carbon emissions. So um, so this is the notion of transformation. And here you see on this slide um, different um, components of transformative education, uh, transformative learning um, that has been identified in the literature. We'll begin uh, just at the top, but they're all. You know, they're all part of a, a kind of mosaic, if you will, for transformative learning. Um, one element I'm going at the t- I'm at the top now is self-reflection, um, including time for learners to um, to bring to mind their own values or experiences and to reflect on those in light of you know new information um, or challenges that are being brought up in the learning environment, like self-reflection on one's um, behaviors that we might see as related to, to sustainable lifestyles or self-reflection on our ideas about who is responsible for trying to address climate change. Um, then it moves to a critical analysis of one's environment. And this is another important element of transformative education because transformative education is supposed to move us into action. And what moves us into action is motivation, but it's also understanding what we want to address. So a critical analysis of one's environment where the problems are that should be addressed is part of the transformative learning um, uh, ingredient. Then we're moving now to the um, bottom right-hand side, dialogue and discussion. Very important to have that kind of um, culture in a learning environment so that individuals um, can be sharing, coming, bringing to mind and sharing their own points of view, um, maybe changing their points of view through discussions with others, but recognizing that in transformative learning, if there is that transformative piece that happens inside of learners, it may well have to do with um, new awakenings or understandings that come from sharing inside of settings like these. New knowledge, that's obviously something that those of you who are educators can offer. So inside of, of greening education, for example, new knowledge about how, um, you know, uh, how greening economies work, uh, alternative energy, um, um, reuse and recycling, how that works, just any kind of knowledge that will uh, enable us to to um, change behaviors and also act in new ways. So, and development of agency and imagination. Um, I like both agency and imagination because agency has to do with, obviously with capacities, um, but imagination is really about, again, imagining what kind of future do we want um, what and just thinking about our own communities, what can we do right now in our communities, our schools, our organizations to be more sustainable, to um, to adapt to climate change and maybe to also contribute to mitigation. Um, and another part of uh, finally of transformative education, if it is happening in the school environment, we want to put learners in touch with um, you know reality as much as possible, guest speakers or t- going on field trips. You know, you can imagine for those of you educators, the very interesting ways in which learning can happen outside of the classroom. In fact, very essential ways that that can happen. So how can schools be transformative? In my remaining time, I'd like to share with you a couple of results of a couple of studies um, that I've been a part of. And these studies have both been characterized by asking youth what they think. So, um, and I want to emphasize that because I have done a lot of educational research in the past. And uh, typically when you're doing like a new curriculum, for example, you know, you, you maybe have it on paper and then you have educators 
um, have a look at it, give you feedback, maybe they pile it in their classrooms. And if you're researching, you're researching the implementation, you know, of the, that curriculum by the, by the educators often, and then the results that are showing up in the classroom along learning outcomes. So it's this kind of sequence from, you know, production all the way to implementation and to achieve curriculum. Um, but, um, and the, but the youth voice here is very much organized typically around the pre-designed elements of the curriculum, right? So um, partly because it's just so much fun to work with youth and partly because again, of all the inspiration I'm receiving from the youth who've taken to the streets around climate change and other uh, issues of our times. I thought, let's go and ask youth um, what, how they remember their experiences in schools and what they find valuable. So one of the studies I participated in, it was a four country study, India, Sweden, South Africa, and the United States. And it's a pretty small study, all things considered. Um, but we um, involved, it involved surveys of 715 secondary school students. It had different components, but one of them was um, had to do with human rights. And um, each in each of these classrooms that was selected, we already knew that students had had some exposure to human rights. And what we wanted to um, find out from the students directly is what they thought human rights were, so kind of a learning outcome, how they learned about human rights in school, what's their recollection of the methodologies used by their teachers, right? And, and then on the basis of all this, how they see that they could be promoting human rights. So again, the youth perspective. And one of the things, so here we go with um, important activities to promote human rights. So I will just tell you now that I'm just gonna pop to ways to promote human rights because this links up with activism, which I'm uh, very, very interested in. So what was interesting from, um, from the results of one of the questions where we asked them to, um, um, to explain, it was an open-ended question. Um, what do you think, what do you see as activities to promote human rights? Very general question. It wasn't what they intended to do per se, so it wasn't a commitment from them. It was just, what are activities that you, you think could promote human rights? And this is very relevant, again, getting back to 4.7, getting back to education for sustainable development, transformative education, right? Transformative learning, which is certainly around human rights, is intended to give learners ideas about what they could do, right? So this is why that question is very relevant in general for our work in education, you know, for sustainable development of 4.7, but um, but also in particular for my presentation to you on transformative um, learning. So many, many, um, the most popular category we coded for the answers was education and learning. So perhaps not surprisingly, um, the, the, the youth, who were still in school when they took the survey, they were still secondary school students, identified education and learning as a really important activity for promoting human rights. And this was, you can see, it was the most popular response coded across all the four countries, um, less so for Sweden, and you can see the variation. Uh, and then some of the very specifics that the, that the students offered to us was education that would happen in a school setting, for example, around Model UN or guest speakers, um, expressing one's point of view, very interesting. So they uh, had recognized their own youth development um, as part of that process of, of, of, of learning and validating that, having discussions. You can see public education and awareness and staying informed. Um, these were all um, ways that these youth had uh, seen that education and learning was relevant. Um, we do have other areas of um, uh, that came out, um, but much less so in terms of like, for example, um, marches or trying to influence governments through lobbying. Um, we did see some of those other indications, but education and learning, those other kinds of you know ways of influencing, in this case, human rights. But but education and learning was by far the most the most um, popular response. And I think that that's um, a nice segue into this uh, next study that I'm still writing up, by the way. Um, but and we're going to be presenting it next year and hopefully getting it published also in a couple of years. So again, inspired by youth activists and wondering what are you thinking about schools? Again, as someone who's been working a lot in curriculum development in the past, and now with the greening curriculum guidance, we're all you know we all have good intentions, thinking we're going to influence schools, right, to offer in this case education for sustainable development. 
Um, but how are youth who are already activated remembering school and their experiences there? Have we got it right in terms of thinking about um, you know, certain kinds of pedagogies or, or curriculum and, and, and, and all that. So this is a, basically a mapping backwards study. So, in, so instead of like, again, looking at, you know, curriculum and its implementation and the results on learners, um, we decided, uh, a former student of mine, Marissa, to um, identify, in this case, it was 28 um, youth activists just in the United States. They were, they graduated from high school. They were now in college or they were college age, and we wanted to interview them and ask them, what influenced your decisions to become motivated and activated around the social issue of interest for you? Not all of them were interested in climate change. They were interested in reproductive rights or um, income inequality or racism, a variety of topics in the U.S. Um, in the U.S. Uh, context. Um, um, but we thought it would be really interesting to hear from them. So we carried out in-depth semi-structured interviews um, for a few years during and went from in-person to COVID. And um, and again, our, our, we really wanted to see what, what, what they would tell us about schools. So the majority of our, our youth um, that um, were, cert, were interviewed um, talked about their schools being, uh, and their classrooms being kind of open and discussion-based. And most of them had service learning or of volunteerism experiences also in, as part of their schooling. And this actually confirms literature we already have that shows that these kinds of qualities of learning in general help to encourage civic engagement. It doesn't necessarily result in quote unquote activism, which is kind of beyond sort of traditional civic engagement to something much more, you know, um, much more, um, the agency of the learner, right? Um, working for, for change that might be um, not prescribed changes, right, in the community. Um, so it was consistent with this other literature, but we also found many other things in the findings that told us that we really had to understand that youth activism, and I would argue transformational learning for youth, has to do with very specific kinds of experiences that are happening in school or not as the case might be. And this brings us to this notion of youth development and psychosocial aspects, which was very, very interesting. So the sources of influences from within the school setting that were identified by youth were still predominantly teachers. I could mention multiple influences. Teachers were the most, um, the most prevalent influence. But then there were student clubs, their friends, a very particular class, not a traditional class like civics. It was a class that typically took up um, themes or allowed them to really think for themselves and write. So writing classes, literature classes um, were mentioned by some students. Um, one student had taken a history of African-Americans in the U.S. was very, you know, looking at um, racism issues in the state. So very stimulating for that student. But, but otherwise, we didn't see civic education at all, by the way. Some of them mentioned their leadership experience in school, but not many, actually. Only 14% of these youth activists who are highly activated leaders mentioned the, the experiences in the school setting as being influential. In fact, some of them mentioned it as a negative experience because they felt that their leadership role was as very tokenistic and very superficial, and they didn't find that they could really express themselves, influence the ways they wanted to. They did mention learner-centered pedagogical culture in the school, um, but what shows up for us here, for Marissa and myself, teachers, clubs, and friends, is the importance of relationship. Relationships for learners um, to, to, to be able to discuss, to explore, to discuss their points of view, reach some conclusions, and on that basis, really um, affirm they're interested in doing, in doing something about it. So this was the common characteristic across the influences that were um, identified by students. And I have to tell you, I was really surprised. I was surprised that the students didn't mention citizenship education. I was surprised at how rarely curriculum happening inside the classroom um, with an explicit reference, you know, uh, intention to promote, you know, um, action of this kind. It just wasn't mentioned by the students. It was almost despite school, if I may say so. And yet within the school setting, there were these places where students found that they could explore their own thinking um, and um, 
And that was, again, in relationships with teachers. Some of these teachers would meet with students individually and have lunch with them because they knew that, you know, the student wanted to talk to them. So it was also these relationships with teachers that was mentioned by students. Um, these were not necessarily happening even inside the classroom. They made connections with teachers and then they, those went outside the classroom, you know, with individual relationships with the students or, you know, or in clubs that the teachers were were um, you know sponsors for these kinds of things. So it came really clear that developmentally speaking, especially secondary school adolescents, relationships really key, and um, and and and dialogue very very important. And those relationships were with teachers, but they were also with their peers. They were um, in in the classroom, in clubs, and um, and this we realized is really important for understanding transformation. So we talk about transformational learning and pedagogy is important. But that pedagogy needs to be linked up with these kinds of things, exploring and expressing one's own point of view. And that's very challenging, I have to say, in a system like the United States, where we have a very prescribed curriculum and very little, little wiggle room for um, you know, deviating, generally speaking, from um, the required curriculum, which is already quite overcrowded. Um, there were other settings in the school besides relationships that fostered transform. I would say fostered transformative learning, project-based learning, art schools, clubs. These were all places again that fostered engagement, moral agency, and social action. Right. And some of these other points are on this slide I've already made, so I'm just going to move ahead now. Um, again, just to reemphasize, the important takeaway here is that. The influences they mentioned, whatever they were, gave young people the opportunity to explore and discuss their own ideas. And the very specific kind of skills that came from this, they developed new skills related to taking action, such as public speaking and campaigning. Um, they started uh, new entities. They joined other youth in, um, in and out of school clubs or even national uh, networks to promote certain kinds of, of social change work. Um, and when they talked about the influences on them, they talked about skill development, but also their values being developed and feeling personally supported. So again, when we think about transformative learning and ESD, uh, we, I think we have to think outside the box. Um, and yes, we want to pay attention to these kinds of pedagogical opportunities like project-based learning, and we need to have that. But to remember that it's that that there's so many other kinds of influences that might be important for us to keep in mind and that, and that the influences are also not just lock, stock, barrel, very linear and very clear. It's it's really just providing platforms for young people to, to critical reflect, uh, reflect on their own thinking, come up with new ideas. And then as they move forward in their own process of activation to feel supported in doing so and to work with others in doing that. So my takeaway now, um, and this is the conclusion of my presentation for you all, thank you so much for your attention, is that for learning to be transformative, we need to empower our learners, people, to make informed decisions and take action, and particularly around sustainable lifestyles and activation for addressing the climate crisis. And we need to go beyond pedagogy. It is important, but we need to take cues from the school setting, from the youth themselves about what they want and what they need. We need to do this also in non-formal education as well, but certainly schools need to do this because they're the ones working on standards, you know, like curriculum frameworks. We need to take the cues from the youth about they, what they want and need. They need to explore issues of personal importance. They need to be able to discuss or even debate different points of view. They need and crave supportive relationships with adults and other learners in exploring difficult topics like climate change. And they need the opportunity to develop their own responses and solutions, not to be slotted into those that we envision for them. So that's my um, that's my conclusion. And um, I just want to, again, thank you for your attention and encourage um, each of you um, to support education for sustainable development, both inside and outside of schools to listen to youth, maybe you are a youth. <laughs> so have your voice heard if you are a youth. Um, to let youth lead and support them if you are an adult and to, and to live uh, sustainably. Uh, thank you so much again. And I wish you a successful um, and a good year ahead.
Professor Dr. We would like to thank Professor Felisa Tipitz for her contribution. We would like to extend our thanks to all the presentation holders today, the managers who made this come true, this event, and all the audience who have participated. I wish you a good evening.